Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Sam Luoma. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, first meeting of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on the Future of Water Quality in Coeur d'Alene Lake. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, uh, chair this uh, august committee. The National Academies has assembled a panel of national experts to address the question of future water quality in the lake, an issue we all recognize as one of, of regional and national importance. I think I can speak for the entire committee and say we're really pleased to participate in this interesting study. Um, our goal here is to assess what we can say about future conditions in the lake in terms of water quality and trends, emphasis on water quality and trends. We will not be talking about solutions. That's not within our remit or our charge. Uh, that will, I, sus I suspect, will come at a different time, but that's not our charge, just so everybody is clear about that. But uh, there's a lot that we need to learn before uh, people talk about solutions, and that's what we're trying to uh, put together uh, in this committee. Uh, this is a group of scientists that are highly qualified in the various areas uh, that are, are of interest to assessing water quality and, and trends in the lake. Um, and so uh, I'll just introduce, I'll have each one of the committee members introduce themselves very briefly, name, uh, affiliation, maybe a sentence about your qualifications, and I'll go last. So. Uh, I would also like to introduce the uh, staff of the National Academy, without whom we would not be able to do any of this. Uh, you'll hear from Laura Ellers next. Uh, she is the, as you can see, she is the person in charge for the National Academy, uh, senior staff officer. Also, she's assisted by Rachel Silvern and Calla Rosenfeld, and our expert, as you saw before, is Eric Edkin, our IT expert. So let's go to the committee. Uh, Robert Amir. Good morning. Uh, my name. My name is Robert Adair. I'm a geocentric consultant, and my area of expertise is water quality modeling. William Arnold. I'm Bill Arnold. I'm a professor of civil, environmental, and geoengineering at the University of Minnesota, and my fate is, my uh, uh, expertise is in environmental chemistry. Michael Brett. Uh, my name is Mike Brett. I'm a faculty at civil environmental engineering at the University of Washington, and my area of expertise is limnology. Uh, Allison Cullen. My name is Allison Cullen. I'm a professor at University of Washington in the Evans School of Public Policy. My background is in civil environmental engineering and environmental health and decision analysis. Uh, James Elser. Hello, my name is Jim Elser. I am a professor at the University of Montana and director of the Flathead Lake Biological Station. I am also a uh, affiliated professor in the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University. And I'm a limnologist, a uh, biogeochemist with a special interest in uh, nutrient limitation and roles of nitrogen and phosphorus. Alejandro Flores. Hi, my name is Alejandro Orlejo Flores. I am an associate professor in the Department of Geosciences at Boise State University. Uh, my background is in uh, hydrology and uh, land atmosphere modeling. Priya Ganguly. Hello, my name is Priya Gonguli. I'm an assistant professor at California State University, Northridge. I study contaminant transport and fate with a uh, focus on mercury biogeochemical cycling and strong interests in mining impacts. Thanks. Robert Hirsch. I'm Robert Hirsch, um, USGS Research Hydrologist Emeritus, located at USGS headquarters in Reston, Virginia. Uh, 40 years of experience at USGS, some of it in senior management positions, but my scientific expertise particularly focused on trends in water quality uh, in, in rivers uh, in particular. Lynn Katz. Hi, I'm Lynn Katz. I'm a professor in civil architectural and environmental engineering at the University of Texas in Austin and director of the Center for Water and the Environment here. Uh, my expertise is in aquatic surface chemistry and um, I'm going to pass off to Scott Hendorf, who I think we might have. Oh, did I skip Scott? Oh, my apologies, Scott. Jeez. No worries. Thanks for catching that, Lynn. Uh, <laughs> I'm Scott Hendorf. I'm a professor at Stanford University, and my area of expertise is in metal geochemistry. Thanks, Lynn. And thank you, Scott. Uh, Jim, James Moberly. Yeah, I'm James Moberly from the University of Idaho in the Chemical and Biological Engineering Department. And uh, expertise lies in fate and transport and biogeochemical cycling of heavy metals. And Jeffrey Schladow. 
Uh, good morning. I'm Jeff Schlatter. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at UC Davis and director of the Tahoe Environmental Research Center. And my expertise is in environmental fluid mechanics with um, lake modeling and measurements being a part of that. Great. Thank you all very much, committee. And uh, I'm uh, Sam, Sam Luoma at the University of California, John Muir Institute of the Environment, University of California at Davis. Um, I've uh, had a long interest in the Coeur d'Alene region. I was born and raised in Montana, so I've got kind of a natural affinity for the area. Uh, and I've been studying and writing since the early 70s on the long-term fate of metal associated with metals associated with mine wastes. Um, and I've published papers in the Clark Fork River, Elk River watershed north of here, the Clark Fork River over the mountain, Southwest England mining district. So these are these are the kind of problems that we will be talking about here, the kind of issues are of great interest to me as well. Very well qualified committee, and it's a real privilege to, to, to be their chair. Uh, just to briefly about the meeting, uh, our charge, very, as I said before, is very specifically focused on the future water quality conditions in the lake, water quality data and trends, not solutions. We're not going to go there, but we're going to set the base for the things that we have to, the people have to know in order to move in that direction. Specific aspects of the scope include uh, evaluate current water quality. That includes the lake, lower rivers, and lateral lakes with a focus on trends in nutrient loading and metals and evaluate the effects of changes in temperature or precipitation on the trends. A couple of questions I think that were raised that the sponsors would like us to address. Does summertime anoxia affect the fate of the metals and nutrients or reduced levels of zinc, removing an important control on algal growth? What are the effect of current trends on release of metal from sediments and the re relevance of metal release written, uh, to human and ecological health? Uh, we will uh, also uh, ask what data are required to reduce uncertainties in assessing, in assessing future trends. What can we do better uh, in terms of uh, evaluating those trends and are there things we can do to make our, make our projections more certain? Today's meeting, uh, first we're going to hear from the various interests who have sponsored the studies, the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality, Kootenai County, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe and United States Environmental Protection Agency. Each will present their role and what they hope we can accomplish. Uh, first, we're going to hear, however, about the lake, some uh, key findings and some just overview of the lake to get us started. I have to emphasize, we're, this is the, since this is the first meeting, we're in the information gathering phase. We're not drawing any conclusions. Uh, at this point, uh, it takes a lot of information to put together one of these uh, reports as, as some of us have done before. And so we're in the very first steps of that. So please be, please recognize that as, as in, in your questions and, and things like that. At the end of our session, we'll have a, at the end of the, uh, of the talks by the sponsors, we will have uh, uh, questions from the panel to the, to the, uh, to the, the presenters. Um, just to pr probably mostly clarification questions, but uh, whatever questions we have. If there's a little bit of time at the end of each talk, we might have a minute for a single question from the panel. All these questions will be from the panel. And then at the end of the meeting, uh, we will have an open mic and there's a list of people who will, uh, who are, have signed up for the open mic. And, uh, and uh, let's see, at, at 9.50, we have a break and Laura, I, didn't get that full conversation. Are we going to? Are uh, people can people sign up for the open mic during the during the break, or is it? Uh, or is that uh, sign list up, complete? Signups have been um, have been turned off, but it's the second during the second break. If you signed up for the open mic session, you will be pulled over into the panelist side of the Zoom so that we can see you and hear you. And um, those people we communicated with last night over email, so hopefully they know who they are and will ask you to use your raise hand feature so that during the second break, which occurs at 11 a.m. Pacific, you will get pulled over and be able to participate in that session. Great. So Pacific time, the first break is 9.50, the second is 11. And on Fridays, Friday, we'll, do a pan we'll have two panel discussions, one on data and one on modeling. Bob Hirsch will moderate the first one, Jeff Schlato the second one. Uh, so then we will go to work uh, gathering information and analyzing data, and we expect this to be about a year and a half process. So you'll hear now from Laura about the National Academy uh, process. Thank you, Sam. I'm now going to share my screen and give a brief introduction to the National Academies. 
many of you are not familiar with our organization, I think this will be helpful to put in our study into context. The National Academies is a very old organization created in 1863 during the Lincoln administration. This is a portrait that you'll see in the main building of the Academies on Constitution Avenue. It's a reenactment of the signing of our charter. The Academies uh, was at that time mainly a small group of preeminent scientists who would advise the government on all topics of science science, but it exists um, three subsequent times over the next century to have a working arm and to have two more membership academies. What does the working arm of the academies do? Our functions are to provide independent scientific and technical advice. We do this by bringing together groups of volunteer experts that meet over a period of time and then usually produce a written report. The National Academies do not lobby or advocate. We are technically a 501c3 organization and thus not part of the federal government, although we do many studies with funding from the federal government. As an organization, there are three membership organizations, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine, which was until recently called the Institute of Medicine. People are elected into these membership societies based on a long body of work. They are preeminent scientists in their field. But the actual work of the academies is done by seven program units, which, um, of which the Division on Earth and Life Studies is the unit that this study is occurring under. And then within that division, there are 11 boards and the Water Science and Technology Board is taking the lead on this project. As an organization, the National Academies produces many different types of products. The one most people are familiar with are the consensus reports, and this study is going to be in that vein. Um, consensus reports are written by expert volunteers who almost reach consensus on the findings and recommendations in their report. And they tend to have a lot of weight when it comes to impacting um, policy decisions where science plays a key role. However, the academies, especially recently, has been doing many more convening activities, such as holding workshops and roundtables, which often produce proceedings. They also have a number of other educational types of products, YouTube videos, Twitter feeds, congressional testimony, reports in brief. At one point, we had a museum on the first floor of our building in Penn Quarter. As a whole, the academies creates about one report a day. So the Water Science and Technology Board in particular, I just wanna tell you a little bit about it. It has a large uh, portfolio that kind of can be categorized into four areas. One of our main areas of emphasis are water and wastewater services. The most recent report uh, in this area was the management of Legionella and water systems report, which came out last year. This is an intractable problem in many buildings. A second area of emphasis for us is um, hazardous waste cleanup. And although the most recent report we did in, in this area was in 2012, the report you see in the middle, um, the academies as a whole is engaged a lot in this topic right now uh, due to PFAS contamination of groundwater. A third area in which we've written, written many reports are aquatic ecosystems and watershed management. We've been doing work in the Everglades, for example, the report you see on the far left for almost two decades. We uh, probably have written a report about every major river basin in the United States at some point in our 35 year history. The report you see in the middle is the most recent review of New York City's watershed protection program. And then finally, a broad category of hydrology, hydrologic sciences. We've written reports on surface water, groundwater, storm water, floods, flood risks, drought, climate change impacts are beginning to find um, a way into almost every report that we write. One of the interesting things about this Coeur d'Alene study is the fact that it kind of uh, has elements of all four of those categories, uh, which I think is going to mean that it's um, going to be a really, really interesting and impactful study. So why would an organization or a group of sponsors come to the academies for a study. There are a number of interesting reasons 
Uh, the first being the statute, the stature of our membership organizations. We often have academy members serving on committees, reviewing uh, reports of committees, uh, giving suggestions for people to serve. There aren't enough of them, obviously, to populate all of our committees. So in addition, of course, we ask uh, the very best scientists and engineers to serve, and we're often able to get those people to serve. People will uh, change their schedules to participate. It's considered an honor to serve on an academy's committee. The third point is by far the most important, which is the pro bono nature of the committee member service. So everyone on this committee is here voluntarily. They are not being paid for their time. Back in the day when we had on-site meetings, we would put them up in a hotel and feed them probably a little too much. Um, but in the virtual environment that we're in right now, uh, the voluntary nature of, of their service, I think, is particularly acute. We have a special relationship to the federal government and the Water Science and Technology Board exemplifies this maybe more than any board at the academies. And that's because uh, almost every major department of the executive branch has some kind of program in water. And at some point in the last 30 years, we've likely done a study for them. We have very rigid quality control procedures at the beginning of our study process and also at the very end when we go through a lengthy external review. So taken all together, uh, these factors lead to a level of independent scientific objectivity and balance that you'd be hard pressed to find from a similar product, say from a consulting firm. I'll leave you with this last slide uh, to give you a flavor for how this study may go well beyond the Northern Idaho, Eastern Washington region. This is a picture of our founding director, Steve Parker, holding a 2000 report that we wrote about New York City's watershed management program. But he's actually standing in Oregon, talking to a forest manager there. And this is the forest manager's copy of the report covered with little sticky notes. He was clearly using it uh, in his program years later after the report was written. So it's just not clear, um, even though this is a regional study, of course, and we want to be responsive to our study sponsors, uh, it's very likely that the findings and recommendations from this report uh, will extend well beyond this region. So I thank you for listening and um, I'll go ahead and give the floor back to Chairman Luoma. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Laura. Uh, very informative for us. Uh, we're going to start now with the presentations. Uh, the first one will be an introduction to Coeur d'Alene Watershed, Coeur d'Alene Lake and its water quality history from Jamie Bruner of the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality and Rebecca Stevens from the Coeur d'Alene Tribe. Good morning, my name is Jamie Bruner. I work for the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality as the Coeur d'Alene Lake Management Supervisor. And I, along with Rebecca Stevens with the Coeur d'Alene Tribe are going to give you a broad overview of the Coeur d'Alene Lake watershed today. So a couple of things before I get into the meat of this presentation. Um, a couple of the primary sources of information that I'll be including in the presentation are in a couple of different places. So one of them is here on the story map on the DEQ website. And it's still in progress. We're still under construction with it right now, but all of the maps should be there. They're interactive. You can click on the zoom in, zoom out and move around. Look at some of the details details in some of these maps, and that's the website where you can find this. We're working on adding some narrative to it now, but it should be functioning as we speak. So I encourage you to go there if you want to dig into any of this information a little deeper. And any of the slides that have this as the source will have a little story map at the bottom right hand corner of the slide. The other source is the Coeur d'Alene Basin Restoration Plan and Environmental Impact Statement. And the website for that is at the bottom of this screen. And the slides that include information from this source uh, will have the reference RP at the bottom for restoration partnership. So we'll start with where we are in the world. You can see Idaho outlined there in the upper left in the Pacific Northwest quarter of the country. Um, and then you can see the little Coeur d'Alene Basin outline there. So we'll zoom in a little on that. So you can see more of the details here. So the, this shows the USGS fourth level hydrologic unit code uh, watersheds. So we've got the Upper Spokane River watershed, Upper Coeur d'Alene, South Fork Coeur d'Alene in the yellow shade there where the Silver Valley is and the mining district. The St. Joe River, um, Coeur d'Alene Lake, 
And you can see that this encompasses Kootenai County, Shoshone County, Benoit County, and also um, the Coeur d'Alene Indian Reservation down here in the lower left. This is their current day reservation boundary, but this entire basin was part of their Aboriginal territory. So then getting a little um, view of the terrain. If you were driving on I-90 right here into the Silver Valley coming in from Montana, this is the top of the watershed driving into Idaho. This is what it looks like um, coming into the Coeur d'Alene Basin, very mountainous and, and forested. And here's a view of the North Fork Coeur d'Alene River, which is in this area, the upper Coeur d'Alene area, popular fishing destination. And then the St. Joe River down here in the bottom of the watershed. And then the lower Coeur d'Alene River, um, you'll hear it referred to the lower Coeur d'Alene River throughout the presentations for these meetings. It starts at about this point right here where the North and South Fork Coeur d'Alene rivers come together and then flows the rest of the way down into Coeur d'Alene Lake. And you can see here on the aerial photo, here's the lower Coeur d'Alene River flowing through the valley. And you can also see that there are a lot of chat, chat lateral or chain lakes that are spread throughout that lower Coeur d'Alene River. There's a lot of wetland habitat in those lateral lakes in the lower Coeur d'Alene River. And then up here in the Northwest portion of the watershed, we have the Rathrum Prairie. This is formed by Missoula flood deposits. And you can see in the aerial photo, it's a nice wide flat valley in the lower end of that watershed. Land ownership, you can see a lot of the upper forested portions of the watershed are federally managed, US Forest Service, there's also um, Bureau of Land Management areas throughout there. Further down in the valley is a lot of private land, a uh, smattering of state managed lands throughout the basin. And you can see again here the Coeur d'Alene Reservation boundary, which consists of allotment and trust lands and also um, primarily private, privately owned land. The geology, the um, Coeur d'Alene Basin encompasses parts of two physiographic provinces, primarily the Northern Rocky Mountains, it's very mountainous terrain, and that's the majority of the basin. Um, but then the lower, the Southern Southwest portion of it also encompasses some Columbia Plateau that has some of the Columbia River basalts. So most of the, the majority of the watershed is belt series metamorphic rock, and that's why we have all the lovely minerals in the Silver Valley that are um, mined out of there it's from this belt series rock. And then the Columbia River basalt in the southwest area in the reservation boundaries and also around the perimeter of the lake itself. And then, like I mentioned, the Spokane Valley Rastro Prairie Aquifer here shown in this picture was formed by those Missoula flood deposits that's very gravelly, um, cobbly, bouldery soil. Soils, um, a lot of silt loams, a lot of organics, um, areas with some stony soils and rock. The upper Coeur d'Alene River consists of silty and stony podzils, which is forest formed soils. The lower Coeur d'Alene River has a lot of wetland area, like I mentioned. There's a pretty thick layer of silt overlaying some silty peat that predates the mining upstream in the Silver Valley. And then there are a lot of, um, like I said, silt loams in the hillsides, finer materials. Um, and then of course we get to the South Fork Coeur d'Alene River that has contaminated alluvium that is toxic to aquatic plants or aquatic life, inhibits plant growth on stream banks and is a source of metals um, still today on downstream to the rest of the Coeur d'Alene River and Coeur d'Alene Lake. St. Joe River has a little more um, sandy granitic influence in, in the soils. And then the lower river also has silt loams and um, moderate erosion generally, except for the floodplain, which is highly erodible. 
the climate, we have moist maritime influence coming from the west from the Pacific Ocean, meeting the cold continental air masses coming down from Canada. That gives us our climate. And we, we have four lovely seasons. We have precipitation, our prim primary precipitation as snow October through April. We do get thunderstorms midsummer, but primarily our precipitation is October through April. We have dry, warm summers, except for those occasional thunderstorms. Um, and the temperatures vary quite a, quite a bit with the season and also the elevation. We have a lot of variability in elevation from 2100 2,100 feet up to um, a highest point of 7,700 feet. And annual precipitation can range from 25 to 80 inches a year. You can see in this figure from the story map that down here in the valley, and when you're in the story map, you can click on this and it gives you um, the values for each of these colors. But down here in the Post Falls Coeur d'Alene area, we're anywhere from 25 to 30 inches a year, but then you get up in these higher areas in the watershed where it's blue and those can be up to 80 inches of precipitation a year. And regional experts are generally seeing um, our runoff is happening, our snowpack is melting off a little faster each year. And so we don't have hard data on, you know, the trends that we're starting to see, but we do have regional experts that have noted that. Here are just a few figures to look at our current and expected future climate. You can see on that top graph, 30-year uh, average temperatures from 1981 to 2010. You can see that hot, dry summer there in July and August. And then, and this information is from the Pacific Northwest Climate Toolbox, which we do also have linked on that story map page. And then future trends um, from that toolbox, we're seeing a warming trend. You can see here on that graph. 1980 to 2015, and no discernible trend in precipitation. But like I said, we do, we do see some earlier last year runoff um, in more recent years. Some statistics for Coeur d'Alene Lake. Oops. Surface area, about 32,000 acres, volume of 2.3 million acre feet. Maximum depth about, depth about 210 feet. The mean retention time says here about six months, but it's really variable depending on the time of year, if we're getting spring runoff and you know, a lot of different variables in there. So it's, it's a little misleading, but mean retention time is six months. Watershed area, 2.4 million acres or right around 3,800 square miles. And then a shoreline length, we do have a fairly undulating shoreline and so it's, um, 150 miles of shoreline, quite a bit of um, shoreline habitat there. The hydrology, you can see from that mountainous terrain and a lot of um, top topographic changes that we have a pretty extensive stream network that flows into the lake. You'll also notice that up in the Spokane or the Rathrum Prairie Aquifer area, you don't see any because it's so permeable um, that streams in that area actually sink into the ground and go into the aquifer. So that's an interesting feature of the landscape. And the two major rivers, you can see the Coeur d'Alene River here. This is the Coeur d'Alene River Basin. And then the St. Joe, St. Mary's down here in the south. There's a look at the flow from 2004 to 2019 to give you an idea of what the hydrograph looks like. Our high flows are generally early to mid spring although we do have some, some later spring runoff events in some years. You can see that in this one, this is 2008, water year 2008. You can see that this was a really late runoff year and it was May, May, May into June for that peak runoff. And this also does show you that at about 20,000 CFS, we do start to see the lower Coeur d'Alene River coming out of its banks. In this particular year, you're probably going to see pictures. I believe there's one picture later that Rebecca will show us that is from this water year during that peak runoff in May. And so now you know what that hydrograph looked like for that year, um, just to kind of log that away in the back of your mind. So what does the lake look like? Down here in the Southern portion, 
um, and the reservation boundary is right around right around here. So right around where the Coeur d'Alene River comes in, the lake from there southward is significantly shallower. So down in the southern end, pretty shallow, pretty productive, a lot of nutrients. And the water coming in from the St. Joe moves north. Water comes in from the Coeur d'Alene River. Can, they both move north together and flow out the Spokane River. So as you can imagine with the metals, as they are coming from the Coeur d'Alene River that you'll hear more about, they're getting mostly pushed up into the north end of the lake. So you start down in the southern end where it's warmer, shallower, uh, more productive, fewer metals. And as you move north, it gets deeper, colder, less productive. Um, generally the bays are you know, a little bit different, but in general, uh, less productive as you move north, colder and deeper. And then here's another view of the lake with, those, with our monitoring locations. Um, so then I'm just going to walk you through a few of the trends that we've seen in the last decade or so of data. Um, dissolved zinc we do see going down as the cleanup activities upstream progress. We see a decrease in dissolved zinc in the northern end of the lake. It's holding fairly steady uh, south of the Coeur d'Alene River. Cadmium is about the same, although we do see a little bit of an increase south of the Coeur d'Alene River in cadmium. Dissolved lead, we see an increase north of the river um, and relatively stable south of the Coeur d'Alene River mouth. Phosphorus, we also see an increase north of the river and variable but somewhat lower in the southern end of the lake. Chlorophyll A, we see um, no discernible trend. Um, it's kind of holding steady in the northern end in the southern end is increasing. And then dissolved oxygen, pretty similar. It's holding kind of steady in the northern end. Um, in the lower end, uh, farthest south, C6 monitoring site, we do see that going down. And then hydraulics wise, we do see some impact from the Post Falls Dam that is near the state line of Idaho and Washington on the Spokane River downstream. And while it doesn't hold the water levels higher than they would have been naturally, it does hold them um, seasonally higher in the summer than they would be. So the high water is the same as what the high water was, but it's held there in the summer as opposed to in the spring when we, when we traditionally would have seen that before the dam. And so that does have an impact inundating some areas in the summer that normally wouldn't be. And with that, I will hand over the controls to Rebecca to take us into the, a little bit of the mining history in the Coeur d'Alene River. Sorry, Jim. I am not showing my video all of a sudden. Should I stop share, make it easier? I think I'm there. Okay. Okay. Good morning and uh, nice to see you. Thank you, Jamie, for that introduction. Um, Stevens here with the Lane Tribe. I am their hazardous program manager in their lake management department. And I'm happy to be here today and provide you some more info to add on to what Jamie's shared. Since time immemorial, the Coeur d'Alene's or the Sitsitsa Umsh, as they refer to themselves as those who were found here by, uh, by the early settlers, which you'll hear more about from Philip's presentation on the tribal perspective, the, the Coeur d'Alene's have always considered themselves as the, you know, the traditional natural resource managers. They continue to do this work to, to protect the lake and all of the resources that that they benefit from, as well as others that have come to the area. And so it's a true honor for me to be able to present um, on behalf of the Coeur d'Alene's. One of our elders, Felix Aripa, was, was a true champion. We have several champions, but um, as an engineer and a, a true lover of, of the lake, um, we like to honor him and, and, and share some of his quotes and how the Coeur d'Alene's viewed the Coeur d'Alene system. Looking at some historical land uses, um, in the late 1800s, silver and gold were discovered near Pritchard, Idaho in the Silver Valley. And with that discovery, logging surrounded the hillsides to support those mining activities and railroad construction. 
For many years, the Union Pacific Railroad hauled ore down the river and across the lake along um, some of the, the rail lines that went in. And, you know, they actually used some of those tailings to build up the rail bed. And as you visit the area as committee members who haven't been up here yet, um, you'll also be driving on Interstate 90, which was also built on mine tailings. Um, as a result to do some of these practices, some of the mine tailings discharged in the floodplains, which I'll be talking about next as well. So here are just some photos because we all love photos. Um, for over 100 years, the Coeur d'Alene Basin and Silver Valley in particular supported um, the production of silver, copper, gold, and zinc to um, help further the efforts of the United States in both World War I and World War II. The heavy metals that we are concerned about in our valley are lead, cadmium, zinc, and arsenic. A little bit of antimony, but those are the main ones that, that rose to the top. And we need these ores. We need these minerals. We all have cell phones. We all have laptops. We're on them right now. Um, so this is just a reality of, um, of what we are experiencing here. And mining continues to happen, not at the scale it once did, but we do still have some active mines. At one time, about 7.3 million uh, metric tons of lead, about 9 million, or about 2 million tons, excuse me, of zinc were um, were produced between the years of 1883 and 1997. As I said, there are still active mines in the valley. Logging supported these activities, not only for uh, producing, you know, putting up the railroads and the rail lines, but also the mines themselves, the tunnels, the shafts. If you've ever been in a mine before, you will see that there are braces and a, a lot of wood down there. So the, the large timbers in our Silver Valley of North Idaho and the National Forest really supported these efforts, as well as um, the work that uh, ensued as far as like transporting timbers down our surface waterways. There's a bottom picture on the left that, that shows some of the traditional practices on transporting um, that wood and actually using it for transportation. For the Sitsin Sitsin, for the Coeur d'Alene, as I mentioned, canoeing was their traditional mode of transport and the surface waters in the lake in particular were to quote Felix their highway um, and so um, the canoe building that also um, traditionally was um, employed in this area was, was really significant for the Coeur d'Alene's. As I mentioned, mining and railroad transport, we had a lot of rail systems. Some are still evident out there. We do have a trail that was converted for, like into a trail of Coeur, the Coeur d'Alene's. It's a 72 mile long trail from the southern part of the current reservation boundary up through and across the lake all the way up to Mullen near the Montana border that Jamie uh, showed you earlier. This was uh, the mode of transport back then. And so um, for most of you that are familiar with, with mining, um, that was the way things transpired. Communities established, of course, to support those working in the mines. Um, this was a photo I think, yeah, from 1900 in Mullen, which I just mentioned. You could just see, I mean, to, to us right now, looking at this photo, it looks as like a devastational landscape because the easiest thing to do back then was to cut the trees down close to your major rail lines or transportation systems and build your homes. And, you know, houses were stacked right up on top of each other. When you all visit the area, hopefully you can go up uh, Burke Canyon, AKA Canyon Creek and East Fort, or the Nine Mile Canyon. Both are major tributaries that come into Wallace, Idaho. You'll see those houses built up right next to the uh, to the road that used to be the rail line. So the traditional mining practices, they didn't have a lot of uh, protections on, on how to uh, process the ore. Um, unfortunately, back then, the, um, the success rate on, on getting out all of the ore wasn't as efficient. It's more like less than 75% efficient in some of the jig tail practices that were employed. <clears throat> and a lot of these systems, tight canyons in the Silver Valley, had to get out the mine tailings and the waste rock in order to continue to mine and, and go into the, the, the mine shafts and, and do the processing. And so in order for them to get those tailings out, they used the river system, the South Fork Coeur d'Alene in particular, to flush out those tailings and get them, get them downstream. Um, the upper right photo I'll talk about in a little while, but this bottom right one is of the success mine, uh, mills, mine and mill site, the success pile. 
EPA is actively remediating, remediating the site and I'll touch bases on that here as to why EPA is in our neighborhood. This is the Cataldo dredge right along I-90. Um, this dredge is no longer active, but it was active from 1930 to about 1968. Um, those mining companies upstream, because they were struggling against the environmental factors that were limiting their ability to get those tailings out of the, the channels, actually formed an upstream mining group in order for them to be able to come together and like work on putting this dredge in place to be able to get those tailings out of the system. This is actually a flood, a huge floodplain. It's still evident today. We have mostly Phragmites growing in this area um, because it's the only plant that can survive in high concentrated soils. And we're talking, you know, thousands of parts per million of lead and zinc that, um, that still exists there today. There currently aren't any plans for EPA to do um, any remedial activities. And as an insult to injury, the tribe actually does own this land at the time. And we're trying to keep uh, migratory waterfowl from, from utilizing this area. So here's the Bunker Hill Mining and Metallurgical Complex site. Um, in 1980, CERCLA was enacted, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act. And due to national attention from doctors and the CDC on blood lead constant levels in children and pregnant women in the Silver Valley, it raised awareness to the top um, after Nixon signed in the EPA as the Environmental Protection Agency as the lead agency for conducting cleanup where hazardous substances have come to be located, this site did rise to the top along with Hanford and for those familiar with the Tar Creek site in Oklahoma. So there's the Bunker Hill site down here is a central treatment plant and or central impoundment area and the central treatment plant. I believe you will hear more from Ed Marine from EPA later on today about this. This is photos from 1990 when the smelter went down um, a neighboring mining uh, area was the, is the Anaconda site in Butte, Montana. That community rallied and actually had their smelter put on the National Registry of Historic Places. So their, their smelter is intact. This smelter went down after Bunker Hill filed, filed bankruptcy with Gulf Resources. And this is just a photo of the community rallying on that um, historic event. <clears throat> Let's see what we got here. Okay, so for those uh, that have worked in Superfund sites before, the way that EPA works with these sites that have been listed on the national priorities list is by breaking them up in chunks or operable units. And so the first operable unit was identified in 1991 as the 21 square mile box around Kellogg, which was the most populated area within the facility. They started assessing and doing their remedial investigation feasibility study within this 21 square mile box. And then in 1992, they issued operable unit two, which was the non-populated areas outside the box. After about 10, 10 or so years in 2002, EPA expanded their operable units to operable unit three. And with each of these operable units comes a decision document, a record of decision on assessing what is in what's out there in the landscape and what type of remedies are, are possible. With that expansion of operable unit three to the, the rest of the basin where hazardous substances have come to be located, 2,100 square, mile or square miles goes all the way down to where the Coeur d'Alene Lake dumps into the Spokane River and the Spokane River um, leaves out the Columbia. However, with that listing and that expansion of the site, there was no remedy identified for the lake. The lake is in the heart of the Superfund facility. It's right in the middle and it drains all the water, the 2.3 million acres that um, make up the Coeur d'Alene Basin. But due to political pressures locally and at the state level during this time, there was a lot of resistance to having EPA come in and um, assign a remedy for the lake. This has always been a, a, a really tough pill to swallow for the Coeur d'Alene's. Um, it's, it, it's caused a lot of uh, heartache for the Coeur d'Alene's who were put here to protect the lake as the center of their heartland. And so after all these years, and you're going to hear more about the lake management plan later today from Jamie and Philip, this continues to be a concern. And this is one of the reasons why the tribe 
withdrew from the lake management plan and why the state has called upon you all from the National Academy of Sciences to assist us in looking at our data. This is a map of the lower Coeur d'Alene River starting up near the Cataldo area going down into Harrison and then the, the river flows north through the lake. These are concentrated levels uh, within sediments and we also sampled for water potatoes when we were proven up injury under our natural resource damage assessment claim, which is a whole different story, but it's definitely part of this story. Um, we still have these, these high levels within the sediment of lead, con uh, lead and cadmium and zinc and the river as she flows continues to transport these metals in a dissolved form down the, the Coeur d'Alene River and, and through the lake system. This whole area has always been considered the breadbasket for the Coeur d'Alene's and um, in 2002 after the issuance of this third record of decision under operable unit three our tribal council uh, sadly had to issue a moratorium on gathering of water potatoes, fishing, swimming, any traditional practices that the Sitsinsum used to rely upon. So now we have a picture of this aerial photo that Jamie referred to from the May 2008 um, high water event. This is the, the outlet of the Coeur River. Over here is the city of Harrison as the arrow indicates. And this is just, this is just a, a, a imagery of, of how those dissolved metals and sediment and the plumes that we see during high water events, not always flood, just even high water events, we can see. Uh, thanks to our, our, our trustees at EPA, they were able to get this aerial footage, grab some grab samples, and on this one day event, the water samples that they were able to grab were about 22,000 parts per million lead. Most of this and these little curls that you might see, that's the influence from the St. Joe River, which flows north from the bottom of the lake and coming in. So it's it's a pretty uh, dramatic photo. So let's look at some current trends in land use. We do still have some agriculture, which I'll touch on. Timber management and harvest is really um, just in the last 20 years have been uh, an all time high. We have healthy forests land use development. We, we see an influx of a lot of people moving into our area. And um, I use the term unbridled development, but that's just my own take on it. We see a lot of residential development along our shorelines of which are left for development. A lot more use up in the river systems that flow into the to the lake. So those those pressures are evident. Tourism, it's an, at an all time high, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. We're seeing a lot of people coming in and utilizing the basin and the, the bounty of the natural resources and recreation opportunities we have here from more restrictive states. Idaho has, is, has been uh, less restrictive on the social distancing and the, the, the things that um, other states have seen being protective. And um, I got an update from one of our colleagues, the regional director of the Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation not too long ago that just this last summer, they saw a 400% increase in Idaho State Park usage, of which they saw a lot of out-of-state license plates. So those pressures are realized for sure. Mentioning uh, when I spoke about timber and agriculture, we have you know, a mixture of, of timber land out there, mostly Idaho Panhandle National Forest with the speckling of Bureau of Land Management. State of Idaho land that they manage is mostly along the waterways. We have some tribal land management um, and with that timber comes the harvesting. Um, the, we do have an Idaho Forest Practices Act that does uh, put upon the those that are harvesting, whether it be private industry or private landowners, things that they need to do to replant, reseed, things of that nature. But um, it seems like every year more and more we're seeing um, more active harvest of, of timberlands which we need, but we all, and we need it for fire management as well. But in areas that you might see, and we'll, we'll hook you guys up with the, the Google Earth link to see the land change over the last 30 years, it's uh, it's pretty evident that our timber production is, is doing well here. And uh, agriculture, we used to have a lot more ag um, agricultural practices up on the Rathrum Prairie above the aquifer. That now is growing houses and development. Um, we do still have some active uh, farming down on the reservation along the southern shores of Coeur d'Alene Lake, mostly bluegrass, 
winter and uh, spring wheat, of which mostly gets uh, shipped off to China. Roads, going back to the Idaho Forest Practices Act, roads should be buttoned up um, when there are harvest practices being employed on the landscape, but that doesn't always happen. Um, here about a decade ago, if not 15 years ago, we started seeing this logging with the intent to build. Um, and there are some local developers that have taken advantage of the ability to log the land, put in, punch in some houses, but the, the roads that they've built for logging do not meet the county standards for, uh, for safety. And, and when that comes, the bleeding streams and undersized culverts and ditches that are just continuing to transport suspended sediment into our surface waters. Back to that tourism and recreation, this bottom left photo is of a popular resort in Coeur d'Alene, Hagedon Resort, Coeur d'Alene Resort, um, very popular. And it's, I think it's made national news. It, you can see all these little specks out there. That's just a typical summer day of the number of boats and recreation we have on this lake. When you look out on our gem, Coeur d'Alene Lake, it, she looks beautiful, you know, diamonds on the water surface and she just looks like a, a beautiful water body. Not knowing that there's about 83 million metric tons of contaminated waste at the bottom of the lake from the upstream historic mining practices. So people come to town, they don't know that history. They don't get that history unless they do their own research. We have our golfing community. Like I said, boating is huge. There's no limit to the number of boats on our surface waters. The only limit that can limit, or the only thing that limits the number of boats on our lakes is parking. So um, people will do what they have to. They will park their vehicles and trailers illegally and pay the $300 fine just to get out on the lake. We love this lake and we're loving her to death. And that's kind of just the reality here because it's a beautiful place. This upper right photo is of Silver Mountain in the Silver Valley right there in Kellogg. Hopefully you all see it when you come to visit. It's doing very well with its winter and summertime recreation with biking and hiking in the summertime and skiing uh, cross country and downhill in the wintertime. And what do all these things do? Well, all of our land use activities, as most of you know, contribute nutrients to our waterways. Mostly nitrogen and phosphorus is what we're talking about. Uh, pets don't pick up after themselves, although that would be great. <laughs> um, with some of the, the farming practices still going on up in the, the lower portion of the Coeur d'Alene River, you know, lack of fencing and whatnot. We do have open range um, laws here in Idaho, so you can, the ca cattle and and li other livestock can access our national forest. And you don't keep track of where, uh, where our animals are going all the time when it comes to that nutrient loading. Another thing you might you'll hear about when Jamie and Philip present on the lake management plan is that that plan did not have any new regulations. That was something that the locals did not want. And so we have been relying heavily upon the current regulations on the books and in particular, Kootenai County um, has a site disturbance or setback ordinance on our, uh, on our lakes. And ours is about 25 feet from ordinary high water mark, excuse me, ordinary, ordinary high water mark. And that's on a slope. I hail from Bemidji, Minnesota, and ours is 200 feet. And so by looking at the shoreline, if you can get out at all while you're here and get on a boat and take a look at the, the shoreline and lack of consistent riparian buffers, um, it'll, it's, a, it's a true story that it tells that we, we, we lack those. Um, we have folks that move in and plant non-native vegetation that requires fertilization and heavy watering, which then contributes to runoff. And when there's no protective buffer, that little minor buffer of a riparian zone, um, we, we see that. That's one of many things. All the other land use, change, or land use um, characteristics that I've explained all contribute to the nutrient loading. Um, Panhandle Health District, along with DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, work together on the septic tanks and septic systems. However, if there are septic systems that are out there on the landscape prior or circa 1974, then they're not in the database. And so we know that there are some out there that are contributing, not knowingly to the landowner probably, but um, all these contribution or contributions add up and to quote Laura and Philip and a number of my colleagues, you know, it's uh, death by a thousand cuts when it comes to living on a, a lake. 
Here's just, it's very boring, but I pulled it off Kootenai County's website and it was the most current from census data. We're seeing a 25% growth increase in the last 10 years. Uh, Kootenai County is at about 177,000 people right now, and it, it continues to grow from folks moving in out of the area and mostly due to the lax regulations that, that we have in North Idaho um, due to um, the voters uh, voting, and that's what they want. They don't want any new regulation, and my own private Idaho is kind of the um, consensus amongst some of, the, some of the folks that live around here. It's just a reality. And so uh, before the, my last slide, this is something you're also gonna see during the Lake Management Plan update presentation on anthropogenic eutrophication. Um, lakes eutrophy, it's a natural process. Uh, basic Limnology 101, nutrients and lakes, they work together, but it's the speed of which we, we um, increase that process and, and the pressures that we put on the landscape. Why we care about it here so much is because of those heavy metal concentrated, those heavy metals at the bottom of the lake that are currently bound to sediment. But under the USGS studies that you will all be looking through and the data, the, the lack of oxygen and those anoxic conditions at the bottom of the lake release that oxygen cap and then metals do have that ability to resuspend and remobilize up into the water column. There, there are a lot of factors in the biogeochemistry around it. You're gonna hear about from Craig and Dale on Friday, but this is just an introductory slide that we like to use with our community when we're trying to express why we're concerned about it. And just to make people aware of what they do on the landscape can contribute to these things. So with that, um, Jamie and I will end our recording because we're gonna be with you live on Wednesday morning to take questions. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you both very much. Um, we do have a minute or two for uh, if there are any clarification questions from the committee. Okay. Raise your hand, please. If you have a question. No questions at this point, it looks like. Uh, we'll just move on. Uh, then, uh, and from next, we will hear from uh, Dan McCracken. This is, these are sponsor presentations, uh, talking about the role of each sponsor and why they funded the study and what they hope to gain. So Dan McCracken first from the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. Dan. All right, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, loud and clear. All right, very good. And let's see. All right, very good. So my name is Dan McCracken. I serve as the regional administrator for the state of Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. And I, I really wish we could we could be meeting in person here in Idaho so you guys could all see our subject matter firsthand. Uh, but I've tried to include as many photos of the lake as I could squeeze into the presentation and, and hopefully that helps break up our our screen gaze that we're going to inevitably have from this PowerPoint zoom marathon that we're all going through. So bear with me on that. Today I'm going to be sharing the state's perspective as a sponsor for the Quilling Lake study. So just a quick overview of the presentation. I'm going to talk about Idaho DEQ's role in the Coeur d'Alene Basin why Idaho requested the study, specifically talking about the importance of Coeur d'Alene Lake to the state, concerns that we have with what we're seeing in current water quality trends, and really what we're hoping to get out of the study, um, confidence in, in understanding the science and, and hopefully that rolling into consensus for action moving forward. So our role at DEQ, at the Department of Environmental Quality, our mission is to protect human health and the quality of Idaho's air, land, and water. So we're the state's environmental regulatory agency. We're charged with ensuring compliance with state and federal environmental regulations. We have specific programs that we oversee for air quality, water quality of surface water, groundwater, drinking water, and wastewater, and then waste and remediation, including solid waste and hazardous waste, and then cleanup of, of legacy sites where those wastes are going to be present, similar to what we have throughout the Coeur d'Alene Basin. In our region, we have 36 employees in the Coeur d'Alene Regional Office and six in the Kellogg Superfund Project Office, 
located specifically for work in the Coraline Basin Superfund work. So some other unique roles that we have uh, in the basin. Uh, we do work closely with EPA on all Superfund activities. We serve as the lead agency on implementation of the human health remedy, which consists of partial removal and consolidation of contaminated soils, uh, primarily in residential and recreational areas. And that's intended to reduce exposure to lead and arsenic in soil and house dust. Uh, the cleanup of residential and commercial properties is largely complete, uh, but recreational areas along the river continue to be a source of, of, of exposure in children. And remediation of the, those areas is ongoing and being coordinated with some of the ecological and water quality remedies that uh, the EPA will tell us a little bit more about later today. Uh, we provide local oversight out of our Kellogg office for, uh, for other ongoing remedial actions. And we also are responsible for long-term operation and maintenance of all federally funded remedial actions. So within the Coeur d'Alene Basin, uh, we have a fair amount of work that was funded uh, directly by EPA. Uh, the state is responsible for maintaining those in, into perpetuity. And we work with the Panhandle Health District on overseeing institutional controls. Uh, within the Coeur d'Alene Basin, the state of Idaho legislature established what's called the Basin Environmental Improvement Project Commission, uh, also referred to just as the Basin Commission. And that provides a, a forum for local government and public involvement in the cleanup process. So DEQ participates in the Basin Commission, which includes a board of commissioners that has representatives from the state of Idaho through DEQ, Kootenai County, Benoit County, and Shoshone County, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe, the state of Washington, and then the federal government through EPA. DEQ also implements the, the Coeur d'Alene Lake Management Plan, uh, which seeks to protect and improve lake water quality by limiting basin-wide nutrient inputs that impair lake water quality conditions and in turn influence the solubility of mining related metals contamination in the lake sediments, which, which kind of Rebecca just showed that, that good overview slide uh, just a couple minutes ago. So we're uh, committed to implement that program collaboratively with the Coeur d'Alene tribe. Um, it was intended to, to function outside of CERCLA at the state's request in response to opposition to Superfund action on the lake when the basin record of decision was developed in the early 2000s. Uh, DEQ also participates in the Restoration Partnership as part of, part of the Coeur d'Alene Basin uh, Natural Resource Trustees, uh, working to restore natural resources that have been injured from legacy mining wastes in the basin. So talk a little bit about the importance of the lake uh, to the state. So Coeur d'Alene Lake really uh, is an important cultural and economic center for the state and, and the whole region and has been for a long time. So the city of Coeur d'Alene is situated along the north end of the lake. And over the years, that's kind of provided the most um, popular, I think, viewing point and, and, and access to the lake. A lot of the prominent public images of the lake are taken from that northern corridor. This is a photo uh, from the Coeur d'Alene City Beach uh, in the 1940s with the historic Playland Pier, uh, which operated from the 1940s to 1970s. Uh, uh, another photo of the same area uh, into the 1960s. And throughout this whole period, um, you know, we, we had been seeing impacts uh, from upstream mining activities, nutrient inputs, um, and the, the lake continued to be, you know, a popular destination throughout all that. Here's kind of a typical modern day uh, shot of the same area at the Coeur d'Alene City Beach with the Coeur d'Alene Resort in the background. Uh, it really, the, the northern corridor of the lake provides easy public access uh, for both locals and tourists. Uh, it's visible from Interstate 90 and provides many travelers a glimpse of the beauty into North Idaho. And uh, Rebecca also had shown kind of that population uh, slide showing the, the rapid growth that we're experiencing in our area. And it's not uncommon to, to meet a new resident in the area and ask, you know, what, what brought you to Coeur d'Alene and find out that they have been driving through the area at some point, um, maybe stopped and got something to eat and just fell in love with the area and, and decided to move here. In, in 2019, this is a, a snapshot of an article from Forbes magazine. Uh, listing the Coeur d'Alene metro area as one of the nation's best small places for business and careers. It has several economic indicators, $6.4 billion in gross metro product, 161,000 people in the metro area. And it describes that the city, which is located on the north shore of the lake, uh, owes a large part of its growth to a substantial increase in the tourism industry, encouraged by several resorts in the area. So the lake really serves as kind of a headliner for our area in terms of uh, economics and cultural importance. And so just recognizing that importance, obviously um, it's import, very important to the state to continue to protect that as, as such an important part of our, of our community. So that brings us 
really to the reason that we requested this study. Um, we're concerned at the state about what we're seeing in water quality trends. This screenshot here in the lower right hand corner uh, shows our report card of the trophic status of the lake from our lake management plan report. Uh, I don't expect anyone to be able to read the numbers. The, the important thing is kind of the color coding there. So where, where a cell is filled in with green, that means we're meeting our, our trigger criteria. As we start to see things in yellow, that means they're approaching the criteria. And when, when we see something in orange, we've exceeded uh, the criteria and, and we're not meeting the criteria that we need to meet for maintaining healthy water quality. Um, one of the challenges is there, there doesn't appear to be one easy solution. Uh, rather, we have dozens of contributing factors, all with a role to play in helping reduce nutrient loading. So, so in moving forward with solutions, um, we need to get an, an, an approach that's going to be uh, you know, broad buy-in throughout the entire watershed. And so to get that kind of support throughout the watershed, we really need confidence in the science. We need a clear understanding of the scope of the problem uh, we need to make sure we have a clear understanding and clearly communicate the urgency of the situation. How soon do we need to do something? How, how much do we need to do? And, and need to know the consequences of the decisions that we make and how that's going to affect ultimately water quality in the lake. And so we're hopeful that with a clear understanding of these things that will help us build consensus for actions taken to improve water quality and protect the lake. So I had shared that 2019 article um, listing Coeur d'Alene Lake as you know, one of the core reasons for the region being one of the best in the country for business and careers. Uh, this is another headline from 2019 uh, with a much different tone. Uh, a dangerous cocktail threatens the gem of North Idaho. Uh, this was an article that was in High Country News and received quite a bit of attention locally um, from local residents and you know, certainly spurred a lot of concern. And I think um, really the article, it describes many of the struggles surrounding the lake and, and the headline really really hits on one of the most important differences in understanding that exists about the lake. So the headline would seem to imply that we have an imminent risk of human health, um, uh, imminent risk to human health. And based on the state's understanding, that's, that's not quite what we have on our hands in Coeur d'Alene Lake. And certainly in the basin, we have some immediate human health risks and are working with EPA to address those through the cleanup um, in the basin. But in Coeur d'Alene Lake itself, we really view the task at hand as much more of a long-term water quality and ecological health challenge. Um, so we continue to view the lake management plan as an important part of that long-term approach, um, but we recognize that our partners at the tribe are frustrated. Uh, so this is another headline uh, from 2019, and, and I think another important part of, of how we landed here. Um, so this, the state, you know, we feel like we've committed to manage this outside of the Superfund process. Um, the tribe is frustrated with how it's going. And we're hoping that this, this study will help us gain a better understanding of the sense of urgency. That seems to be kind of the major, um, major differences, I think, of, of where we are today. So one of the, one of the challenges for the state in, ter in terms of understanding and communicating the urgency of the situation is that the problems with metals and nutrients in the in Coeur d'Alene Lake are, are really not new issues. These are things that have been going wrong, going along for a long time. Um, we even have, a, I, I appreciated um, in Laura's slide, the photo of the uh, National Academy report with all the bookmarks on it. This is, um, this I'm holding up here is a copy of the 2005 NAS study on the Coeur d'Alene Basin, uh, specifically looking at, you know, Superfund and, and mining mega sites. Um, this is a quote actually that was in the historical background for that report. Um, the state of Idaho legislature had established the Coeur d'Alene River and Lake Commission in the 1930s uh, to try to deal with some of the challenges they were seeing with tailings disposal. And they wrote to federal experts uh, requesting help, saying, our river is gone for the time at least, but we would really like to save our lake. Will you help? And the, the background photo there shows the south fork of the Coeur d'Alene River just completely fill, filled with tailings and, and was devoid of, of aquatic life at the time. And they they recognized the need to try and that, you know, they were seeing what was happening to the river and hoping, hoping to take action to save the lake. Um, they didn't ultimately get to the, the, the bottom of the issue at that time. And, and so we've been working on it for a long time, but we're hopeful that uh, we're getting closer to a solution. In addition to metals in the watershed, um, we've also had ongoing challenges with nutrients. Raw wastewater was directly discharged into surface water throughout the basin for, for many decades. This is a photo of uh, Burke Canyon along Canyon Creek showing um, here we have uh, outhouses uh, for the homes perched right over the creek. And this was the common you know, wastewater disposal practice uh, throughout the basin for a long time. 
Um, interactions between metals and nutrients in the watershed continue to be a water quality challenge um, you know, into the 1960s and 1970s. As regulations were developed to push to eliminate discharges of tailings into surface water, you know, there were discussions about how does that, what, what's that do for the lake? How, how, do, we, um, how do we deal with that? Uh, this is a quote that came from a, from a mining history journal um, stating that with raw sewage still entering the river in 1967, the Coeur d'Alene Lake Property Owners Association appealed to the Idaho Department of Public Health to ask the mining companies to continue discharging tailings into the river since the tailings would destroy the bacteria from the sewage. So I think we would all agree that fortunately, um, we, we move forward with eliminating both tailings and raw wastewater discharges from the river. Um, and we've continued to see positive trends in the river from the efforts with the Superplant clamp. But in the big picture, you know, we still have long-term concern over, over how those things are, are influencing the lake in the long run. So we really see at the state, we see the need for, for long-term solutions. There, there doesn't appear to be a quick, easy fix. Uh, Rebecca had you know, pointed to the, you know, the problem you know, is, is coming, but you know, death from a thousand cuts. And the solution is you know, taking each one of those thousand things and, and um, addressing them. So the solutions are gonna take time to develop, take time to implement, and, and ultimately take time to see the results. And with that slow response of work at a watershed scale, it becomes that much more important that we have confidence in what we're observing and then what our predictions are for how our actions are going to influence water quality conditions. So we, we see that as you know, really behind the need for a strong understanding in how the ongoing work in the basin will influence the dynamic between metals and nutrients in the lake. Zinc is going to continue to decrease as we complete more remedial actions upstream and improve the river. And we need to have confidence um, in what that means um, in terms of what's happening in the lake. Uh, we also think that continuing the lake management plan is important in the long-term approach. We believe that this decision that was made to manage the lake outside of the Superfund process really was made in good conscience in response to input from the public. And so we're committed to continuing on that path. Um, and we take really particular interest, I think, in the findings of the committee with respect to the urgency of the water quality conditions. And really, what, what does that mean um, in terms of what poses a threat to human health and what poses a threat um, to long-term ecological recovery of the lake. So overall, the state is really hoping um, for these outcomes of the study. We, we want confidence in the science um, with a clear understanding of the scope of the problem, uh, the urgency, what those things, you know, what the, what the conditions in the lake mean for human health and ecological health, and understanding the consequences uh, of the decisions that we're going to be making. And ultimately, we hope that that can help us build consensus for action moving forward uh, to restore the watershed and protect Coeur d'Alene Lake. And so with that, I'd like to thank the committee members for your participation in the study and providing your expertise to help us with the problem. And I think I might have uh, just a minute or, or two for questions. Yeah, we've got a, one minute for any clarification questions from the committee. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Seeing no hands, uh, thanks for the great presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, and we're gonna shift the order just a little bit here. Uh, we're gonna ask EPA, if you don't mind, Ed, we're gonna ask EPA to uh, give their presentation now, and then we'll, uh, then, then we'll uh, try to get Kootenai County after that. So Ed uh, Marine from the EPA Region 10 will speak, and uh, then Cami uh, Grandinetti uh, will also uh, speak. So thanks very much, Ed. Hi, my name is Cami Grandinetti and I work in EPA Region 10's Water Division. I'm the branch manager of the Standards Assessment and Watershed Management Branch. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Clean Water Act authorities and tools and how they're used in and around Coeur d'Alene Lake. The state of Idaho has been delegated Clean Water Act authorities and those include the ability to establish water quality standards. Water quality standards are levels of pollutants or contaminants that are set to protect the designated uses. Designated uses are, for example, um, if a water body is, is a recreational use, if people swim there, if they fish there, if they drink the water, or if there are salmon spawning, all of those uses uh, will be protected or should be protected by the water quality standards that are set by the state. 
The state also has the authority to identify impaired water bodies, um, and that is done by comparing the water quality against their standards to determine whether or not the water body exceeds those standards and whether they should be listed um, on the 303D list. Once water bodies are identified as impaired and listed on that 303D list, then there's a re requirement to develop a total maximum daily load, and the state also has that authority. Total maximum daily loads establish the maximum load of pollutants or contaminants that can be discharged into a, an impaired water body um, for both point sources and non-point sources. Point sources are easy to describe and see. They're, they're pipe discharges that go directly into the water. Non-point sources are, are harder to see. They're the diffuse runoff um, that comes from all of the land within a watershed. So think of runoff from a field, from forest, from developed lands, from parking lots, from residential areas, everything that flows off of all of those um, uh, land areas and finds, and that water that finds its way into creeks and streams and eventually into the lake, all that is known as a non-point source. Um, in Idaho, the Coeur d'Alene tribe also has treatment as state uh, authorities um, under the Clean Water Act for the water bodies within the reservation. Currently, the Coeur d'Alene tribe has treatment as state uh, for, what, for setting water quality standards, and they have done so within their reservation, and that includes the lower third of the lake. The Coeur d'Alene tribe does not currently have treatment as state for assessing water quality, listing impaired water bodies, or developing total maximum daily loads. Let's talk a little bit about TMDLs and, and listings um, in and around the lake. In 2000, Idaho and EPA jointly established a metals total maximum daily load for Coeur d'Alene Lake. EPA was part of that and issued it for tribal waters since the state or since the tribe does not have TAS to do that for its waters. That TMDL was challenged and ultimately vacated by the Idaho Supreme Court in 2003 for failure to follow state rulemaking provisions. The state has not as of yet replaced that metal TMDL. Coeur d'Alene Lake is not currently listed as impaired for nutrients, and this limits further Clean Water Act uh, work, such as developing a total maximum daily load. There is a potential that the lake could be listed as threatened um, on Idaho impaired waters list. Uh, and uh, if Idaho did that, it would be uh, limited. Idaho would be limited to doing it only on state waters. The lake management plan was developed by the state and the tribe together to, um, and it outlined a strategy for evaluating water quality and identifying sources of nutrients to the lake. This is important, um, as you'll see, in the stated goal of the plan, and that was to protect and improve lake water quality by limiting basin-wide nutrient inputs that impair lake water quality conditions, which in turn influence the solubility of mining-related metals contamination contained in lake sediments. The, the state and the tribe knew that in order to protect and, and keep the lake healthy um, and keep the metals in the bottom of the lake that are buried or that are very deep uh, below the, the surface, it's important to uh, manage the nutrients within the watershed. Managing nutrients in this watershed is important not only for containing metals, but also in reducing or managing algal growth. You may be hearing more about what we call harmful algal blooms or HABs. And harmful algal blooms are uh, algal blooms that end up releasing toxins. And those are extremely toxic to people and pets or can be when you're exposed to them in the water. Non-point sources, as we've learned, are significant sources of nutrients. And nutrient loading to watersheds is a, is a big contributor to um, algal blooms and potentially to harmful algal blooms um, coming out of those. So addressing non-point sources in this watershed is key to the health of the lake, not only again for metals management, but also algal bloom management. Non-point source management under the Clean Water Act has been delegated to states and tribes with treatment as state. And I just uh, have a picture here on the right of Lake Fernand, which is just northeast of Coeur d'Alene Lake, just right very close to it, in fact. And um, unfortunately, every year now, they're starting to see large algal blooms there. I, uh, and I, I grabbed this picture. You can see in the foreground the algal bloom that has 
um, formed in this in this picture. And um, hopefully that doesn't happen in Coeur d'Alene Lake. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ed Marine with the United States Environmental Protection Agency. I work in Region 10. My title is Section 1 Chief. I oversee 10 remedial project managers and multiple cleanup sites. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the Bunker Hill Mining and Metallurgical Complex Superfund site. The photo you see is the former lead smelter operated by Bunker Hill Company in Kellogg, Idaho. Kevin Gradinetti has given you an overview of the water division's role in the Coeur d'Alene Basin's watershed. Now I'm going to give you an overview of the Superfund's program in the Bunker Hill site. In addition to the role, I'm also going to talk about geographical orientation and terminology. I'll very briefly touch on the Superfund Remedial Investigation Feasibility Study process. In addition, I'll tell you about our decision documents, cleanup priorities, and show you some snapshots of success for the cleanups that have happened to date, along with our next actions planned. So the remedial investigation feasibility study process under Superfund is performed after a size list on the national priorities list. The remedial investigation component is the mechanism for collection of data, the determination of the nature of waste, assessment of risk to human health, and the environment. The feasibility study component of the remedial investigation feasibility study process is the mechanism for the development, screening, and detailed evaluation of remedial action alternatives. The Bunker Hill site was listed because of releases from mine operations and from the smelter complex itself. So the focus was on those releases as well as the mining and milling operations. Nutrients have not been a focus of the cleanup response unless they were tied directly to mine processing activities. CERCLA is the Superfund law. CERCLA stands for the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. CERCLA guides EPA on which sites warrant further investigation. EPA's mission and authority to address sites is pursuant to CERCLA for protection of human health and the environment. CERCLA enables EPA to conduct remedial investigations. It also includes provisions to require that polluters pay. Responsible parties perform cleanup and or reach financial settlements with the United States government. On slide five, you will see displayed the ecological risk assessment map that was developed in the late 1990s to go along with and guide the ecological risk assessment. There's some key points on this map that I want to draw to your attention to. The Montana border is on the eastern boundary of this uh, map. The Bunker Hill box is the gray shaded area that surrounds Kellogg. That's a 21 square mile area. It's bounded by Pinehurst and Elizabeth Park. It's the location of the former Bunker Hill smelter. The lower basin is everything to the left or west of the gray box, the Bunker Hill box, and the upper basin is everything, including the box, and to the right. The south fork of the Coeur d'Alene River is the primary stream running down the center of the valley, and it flows into the Coeur d'Alene River at Kingston. The South Fork, Canyon Creek, and Nine Mile Creek, along with Pine Creek, were the areas of the predominant mining and milling in history. Lake Coeur d'Alene is between the Coeur d'Alene River and the Spokane River, and the Spokane River is the outlet of Lake Coeur d'Alene. To understand the site, you also need to understand how large this mining district was in terms of production. So the Silver Valley is a fond term it's commonly used for the Coeur d'Alene Mining District. And you can see in this graph, the amount of ore production in terms of megatons is humongous. Along with that production, of course, came a lot of waste, and we will talk more about how the waste was handled over time. And it's important to recognize that there were some significant changes over time. Early on, the recovery processes were poor, jig tables were common, in which only 50 to 80% of the lead was recovered. Uh, later on, flotation processes were used in the late 1930s. And with that, you had finer material and lower metals concentrations in the waste material because the recovery rates were better. 
It's important to note that until the 1930s, 100% of the zinc was discharged as waste product. It was not a commodity in those times. EPA initiated a remedial investigation in 1998 to investigate mining contamination in the broader Coeur d'Alene Basin. The area of coverage included the Coeur d'Alene River and its tributaries, Coeur d'Alene Lake, and the Spokane River. The study excluded the Bunker Hill box, but evaluated impacts to the south fork of the Coeur d'Alene River where it ran through the box. This is because EPA had been addressing mine waste contamination in the Bunker Hill box in operable units one and two for some time. Collaborative effort involving many stakeholders was undertaken. So we'll get into the sources of the contamination now. This photo shows the south fork of the Coeur d'Alene River near the eastern end of the site in Mullen, Idaho. It's called the Morning Mine and Mill. The river is the south fork. As you can see, the water is opaque and is running in the foreground. The reason it's opaque is because it's carrying tailings. And you can see that the channel is surrounded by tailings. There's a tailings pile on the far side. And there's also a sluice line. And you can see that there's water running from the outlet of that sluice line directly into the river, carrying tailings with it. There were many, many mining features in the Coeur d'Alene Basin. This map, generated by the Bureau of Land Management, displays a black X for each mining feature. Some of the data used to support EPA's remedial investigation included BLM's identification of 1,080 mining-related source areas in the basin, as you saw in that previous map. There were nearly 18,000 sample results of soil, sediment, surface water, and groundwater used. More than 10,000 samples were collected by EPA. Another 7,000 additional samples were collected by the states, tribes, mining companies, the U.S. Geological Survey, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and others under agreements and funding by EPA. The remedial investigation revealed that mining waste contamination was widespread in the Coeur d'Alene Basin. This depiction displays that you can see red squares coming down from the near the Montana border on the upper portions of the South Fork of the Coeur d'Alene River. There are two creeks that are coming in. Those look like prongs. That's Nine Mile and Canyon Creek also showing high concentrations on down the South Fork. The conglomeration of squares that makes it look like a larger red square is actually located near the, uh, the former lead smelter. And you can see it continue on down into the lower basin in the main stem of the Coeur d'Alene River and on into Lake Coeur d'Alene. Red squares indicate concentrations greater than 2,000 parts per million lead. And the blue circles indicate concentrations 500 to 2,000 parts per million lead in the soils and sediments. Slide 12 displays zinc exceedances with respect to ambient water quality criteria in the Coeur d'Alene Basin. This slide is depicted from the left to right, upstream to downstream. There's four bars that jump out of you off the slide. One is at Canyon Creek, the other is at Nine Mile Creek. Then there's the South Fork at Elizabeth Park and the South Fork at Pinehurst. Those last two bound the Bunker Hill box and the groundwater collection system that has been recently installed. You can see a significant increase in concentrations there. Another thing to point out here is the dashed line that's uh, 10 times the ambient water quality criteria. Again, so these these bars are well above that and are many times the ambient water quality criteria. Due to the large amount of contamination being spread throughout the system, several landowners downstream were complaining and filing lawsuits against the mining companies. So the mining companies installed plank dams across the south fork of the Coeur d'Alene River and one across Canyon Creek. None of them lasted long, but they did hold back some of the tailings that were discharged for a certain amount of time. The mining companies tried to reclaim some of those trapped tailings, but of course nature had its way and blew out those dams. And as you can imagine, spread those tailings uh, downstream as usual. Contaminants from the smelter also rained down on the neighboring communities in Kellogg and other areas. Bunker Hill Smelter operated from 1917 to 1981. The 1973 Bag House fire burned the smelter's primary pollution control system, resulting in uncontrolled emissions. Particulate emissions increased from 10 to 20 tons per month to up to 160 tons per month. 
containing 50 to 70 percent lead. Blood lead levels also skyrocketed when monitoring began in the 1970s, some of the highest blood levels ever recorded from this area. You can see in the middle photo the result of sulfur dioxide being emitted from the stacks, mixing with water vapor, creating acid drain, and killing the hillsides, denuding the vegetation. Air inversions were also common, as is evident in the photo on the right. This photo is of the central impoundment area looking from the west. It was constructed in 1928 by the Bunker Hill Mining Company. Kudos to them for jump, jumping out and constructing tailings impoundment. Unfortunately, they sited it on top of riverbed at a time when there were no environmental studies or liners in use. Bunker Creek runs to the right of it, and the south fork of the Cordine River runs to the left of it. This happens to be the most significant loading reach of dissolved metals to the South Fork in the entire basin. Slide 16 also shows a photo of the central impoundment area. We have pivoted 90 degrees and now the top of the photo is north. The central impoundment area is in the center. I-90 runs from east to west on the north side of the central impoundment area. The yellow indicates losing reaches on the South Fork of the Coeur d'Alene River and the blue indicates gaining reaches in, the, in that South Fork. The colored dots are wells that were monitored, and the color indicates concentrations of dissolved zinc. A red well, or a red circle, indicates 20 to 40 milligrams per liter zinc in those wells. This is a picture of a lower basin river bank. Notice the depth of the contamination. It's about six feet, because that spade is about three feet tall. The concentrations are characteristic of riverbed and banks in the lower basin. Notice that the higher concentrations are in the lower strata. They decrease as mining operations became more efficient. These metal contaminations are present in beds, banks, and floodplains of the Coeur d'Alene River, lateral lakes area, and in some patches in the Spokane River. There's also widespread groundwater contamination. Flooding continues to redistribute these contaminants throughout the system and contaminants in the communities can be up to 10 feet deep. The remedial investigations for surface water findings are the ambient water quality criteria is exceeded by varying degrees throughout the entire 166 mile basin. Species density and diversity have been reduced throughout the basin. Nine Mile and Canyon Creeks are essentially devoid of fish and other aquatic life. The habitat fragmentation and destruction also prevents a sustainable fishery. The largest dissolved zinc and cadmium loading is occurring in the Bunker Hill box adjacent to the central impoundment area, and the largest increase in total lead occurs in the lower basin. The fate and transport of mine waste materials is affected by several factors. One, the fluvial processes where tailings are transported downstream, especially during high flow events. Those tailings are then deposited in downstream beds, banks, and floodplains. The fine grade material might wash through Lake Coeur d'Alene and be deposited in the Spokane River. Groundwater is also affected by several processes. One, just between groundwater and surface water interaction. There's also chemical, biological, and electrochemical reactions. Long-term process of source depletion is also at play. And of course, acid mine drainage discharges to surface waters directly from mine adits. In the past, tailings and mine waste was also used as fill beneath communities and in road and other infrastructure construction. Before we go on to more site-specific activities, it's important to understand Superfund risk assessment fundamentals. From a human health risk assessment standpoint, it's important to determine the safe level of each potentially dangerous contaminant present. At the Bunker Hill site, it's heavy metals as a result of mine waste disposal practices of the past. From an ecological risk assessment standpoint, you look at risk determined by a function of receptors. The nature of adverse effects caused by the contaminants, again, at Bunker Hill, that's heavy metals, and the desired condition of the ecological resources. Slide 21 displays the chemicals of potential concern and the affected media as part of the Bunker Hill risk assessment. As you can see, the metals are listed on the left-hand side. Those are all from mine wasting and mine waste contamination. And you can see the affected media uh, scrolled across and if those chemicals 
contained in that media of the uh, right-hand columns. Slide 22 is a summary of the ecological risk assessment findings for the Bunker Hill Superfund site. For birds, there was risk found to 21 of 24 species. There was high waterfowl mortality due to the ingestion of lead contaminated sediment and the risks posed by elevated lead, zinc, and cadmium were common. With respect to mammals, 12 of 18 species were at risk. Zinc, lead, and arsenic were the most common risk drivers. There were three remedial action objectives identified in the feasibility study for the site. One, aquatic life protection for dissolved metals in streams and rivers was essential. Zinc and cadmium were the primary drivers. Waterfowl protection from lead in wetlands and floodplains was another objective. And three, the reduction of particulate lead transport in surface water. For example, recontamination issues and downgrading impacts. Four primary decision documents were issued for the Bunker Hill Mining and Metallurgical Complex Superfund site. Record of decisions for operable unit one and two were issued in 91 and 92. Those pertain to the populated areas and the non-populated areas in the Bunker Hill box. Operable unit three is everything outside of the box, and that's commonly referred to as the Coeur d'Alene Basin Rod. It was issued in 2002. The 2002 rod was amended by an Upper Basin Rod Amendment that was issued in 2012. Slide 25 is a short summary of the Operable Unit 3 record of decision. It was issued in 2002. The estimated cost was $360 million and it was predicted to operate for 30 years. The final cleanup for human health exposure to residential and community soils was selected in this record of decision. It was deemed to be an interim cleanup for ecological protection based on benchmarks. It does not meet protecting the standard or applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements. It does not include groundwater or Coeur d'Alene Lake. It also does not allow for the practice of tribal or subsistence lifestyles. A remedy for Lake Coeur d'Alene was deferred due to the low risk associated with the metals that reside in Lake Coeur d'Alene. The Upper Basin Rod Amendment Summary is found on slide 26. I'll go over briefly. It was issued in 2012. The cost was estimated to be $630 million and it was expected to take 30 years to implement. Source control actions at Upper Basin Mine and Mill sites through consolidation and isolation was one of the primary remedies. Also construction, operation, monitoring, and maintenance of repositories to house those contaminated soils is a key ingredient. Remediation of road surfaces was called for. Implementation actions to protect remedies from erosion and recontamination was also a primary ingredient. The completion of the human health remedy was called for. It also called for the implementation of upgrades to the central treatment plant and the construction of the groundwater collection system in the box to address the highest loading stretch in the basin. It also called for implementation of groundwater remedies in Nine Mile and Canyon Creek watersheds, among other things. We're going to shift gears now and highlight some of the cleanup actions and successes we've had in the site. You can see on the left hand side is a property remediation during remediation and after in the lower photo and then road uh, existing conditions on the upper photo and post remediation in the lower photo. The thing about the roads is you can see where the alligator cracks are occurring. It's very reddish in, in the hue due to water pumping up through the roads itself and carrying dissolved metals with it. Here's another snapshot of success. This is remedy protection. I discussed that a little bit earlier, but you can see there's a new concrete box culvert on the left. And on the right, you see a new retaining wall because drainage coming off that hillside was actually streaming down and washing out the newly remediated property behind this house. Slide 29 displays uh, the eastern portion of the Superfund site. You can see the towns of Mullen working from right to left, and Wallace, Silverton, and Osborne. The blue arrows are calling out various projects in the communities that are for the most part remedy protection projects, as we've seen photos of earlier. There are mine and mill sites, which are designated by M&M, &M, on the East Fork of Nine Mile Creek. Interstate Callahan mine and mill was the first. Success was the next mine and mill site to be cleaned up. Those are all done. 
and there's a waste consolidation area located on the upper portion of the nine mile drainage. Here's a snapshot of the success mining mill. Thing to note is the left hand side, that's all mine waste, waste rock and tailings plugging the drainage. You can see the drainage being cleared out, uh, reconstructed and revegetated here in the photo on the right. Slide 31 is the blood lead level monitoring for the Bunker Hill box from 1970s to recent days. As you can see, the communities are different colors, red, blue, and green. They all approximate each other with time. The black line is the Center for Disease Control Lead Health Standard. And the dashed line is a US average, which approximates the local monitoring data trend line. Slide 32 is an aerial photo of the Bunker Hill box. You can see the central impoundment area that sits in the center of the photo. There's a black line to the north and west of the central impoundment area. That's depicting a groundwater cutoff wall, along with extraction wells denoted by targets. To the southeast of that is the central treatment plant, which treats groundwater from that extraction system, as well as water that flows out of the Bunker Hill mine. The Bunker Hill mine is depicted to the southeast of the central treatment plant. The town of Kellogg is to the east. The town of Smelterville is to the west. And the former smelter complex sat to the southwest of the central impoundment area. We can see some results from the recent monitoring of the influent and effluent. Slide 33 displays the zinc monthly average CTP loadings, which is loadings to the central treatment plant. Effluent was less than two pounds per day, while influent in pounds per day at one point was 1,000 in August and is down to about 680 in December. It is somewhat variable due to the mine flows as well as uh, the groundwater and the system coming online and being calibrated. The next slide is still focusing on the effluent from the central treatment plant. Slide 34 displays TSS, which is total suspended solids, uh, total zinc, total lead, and total cadmium in terms of effluent as, as compared to the discharge limit. As you can see, the blue effluent is much less than the orange discharge limit for each one of these constituents that is monitored. Mm. Phosphorus is not a constituent of concern, nor is it on our discharge permit, but we are monitoring both influent and effluent at the central treatment plant. As you can see by the blue bars, the influent loading is variable. The effluent loading is very consistent and is averaging 0.15 pounds per day. This is a very short period of record. In fact, I, we don't even have a good data set here to be doing a significant analysis on, but um, we will continue to collect data. We'll be interested to see how this plays out over time and after the plant has been shaken out. Slide 36 depicts a agricultural land that has been converted into a wetland through an easement. The photo on the right displays tundra swans, which migrate through on their spring migration north each year. They suffer large mortalities in the basin due to lead ingestion and poisoning. Shifting gears from snapshots of success to how do you manage and protect this remedy? And the answer to that is institutional controls, which are non-engineered instruments, such as administrative and legal controls that help minimize the potential for human exposure to contamination and to protect the integrity of the remedy. Three primary components, protect the remedy, protect public health, and assist with land transactions within the site boundary. Key take home message from this slide is that contamination exists at depth throughout much of the Silver Valley, even after we remediated properties. In this case, you have soils that are 27,600 parts per million lead and greater than 12 inches of depth, even though there's a clean overlying barrier above that. This requires resources to manage in the communities of the Silver Valley at all times. Slide 39 displays the challenges throughout the Corn Lane Basin that present themselves to the agencies that are responsible for cleanup and protection of human health. You can see people playing in the creeks. You can see boaters and kayakers playing on the, the Corn Lane River and lounging on its banks. You can see folks having mud bogs. You can also see dead swans, and you can see water percolating out of a mine site that's probably out of water. 
These are ongoing issues site-wide. It's important that we recognize all that EPA and its partners have accomplished in the Coeur d'Alene Basin. Those accomplishments include remediating over 7,000 residential, commercial, and public properties, remediating over 500 roadway segments, continuing to treat over 16 billion gallons of acid mine drainage prior to discharging clean water into the South Fork of the Coeur d'Alene River from the Bunker Hill Mine, consolidating and managing millions of cubic yards of contaminated soils into repositories while operating and maintaining and monitoring repositories. We've installed and refurbished remedy protection stormwater systems to prevent recontamination of remediated properties. We've addressed recreational sites, which is a highly dynamic world. We've stabilized abandoned mine sites and consolidated mine wastes. We've stabilized and revegetated thousands of acres of hillsides. We continue to monitor children's blood lead levels and perform lead health intervention as needed. We have ongoing outreach and education and we have ongoing implementation of the Institutional Controls Program. The next steps for the Superfund Program is to continue to address the source areas in the Upper Basin. Nine Mile and the Canyon Creek drainages are the primary areas for that activity right now. We will continue to address recreation sites as they arise, and we will continue to establish clean waterfowl habitat actions. We're going to implement pilot actions to address riverbed contamination in the main stem of the Coeur d'Alene River. We're going to continue to operate and maintain the central treatment plant and groundwater select collection system. That system will be operated by Idaho beginning in October, but that operation and maintenance will continue. It's important to recognize the many stakeholders involved in a site like this. Citizens, we have three counties, Kootenai, Shoshone, and Benoa. We have the Basin Environmental Improvement Project Commission. We have the states of Idaho and Washington, as well as the Coeur d'Alene Tribe and the Spokane Tribe, and the Natural Resource Trustees, as well as community leaders. In summary, the Silver Valley was one of the world's most productive mining districts for the better part of the century. Historic mining waste disposal practices led to widespread contamination of heavy metals in rivers, floodplains and lakes, and community areas. Risks from historic mine waste are real and not theoretical. There was high historic blood levels in children. The annual waterfowl mortality is high in this basin. Surface water concentrations are 10 to 100 times higher than site-specific standards. EPA, with the support of IDEQ, has been leading the cleanup for over 30 years and will continue for at least that long. EPA's mission is to protect human health and the environment and therefore is the appropriate agency to address these issues. EPA would find it to be of great assistance if the Academy reviews all relevant data sets in order to identify spatial or temporal trends and biogeochemical processes impacting metal and or metalloid and nutrient levels and cycling within Lake Coeur d'Alene, as well as identifying pathways and processes impacting nutrient levels in Lake Coeur d'Alene that can be used to inform local management options to protect our gym. Furthermore, examples of other lake environments with similar conditions and a summary of successful efforts to address those conditions could be very beneficial for all involved. In closing, I'd like to say thank you for your attention to this brief introduction to the Coeur d'Alene Basin Superfund site. As you now are aware, extensive studies have been conducted. Human health is the first priority in the cleanup program, and we have and continue to address exposure and risk to people. Source control is a key component of the cleanup and will take decades. Choices regarding prioritizing work for ecological risk will continue to focus on targeting actions that address the most significant risks. Engineering controls and institutional controls will always be a critical part of the overall remedy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I would ask all the speakers to remember to hang around after the break, but first we're going to go for another short talk from uh, Chris Filios for Co from Kootenai County. Chris? Okay, so good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. Um, I think it's a privilege to be able to participate in the study. I understand I've got five minutes, so I'll be taken to the point. Uh, let me start off by explaining a little bit about Kootenai County. Uh, arguably, we're one of the fastest growing counties uh, in, the, uh, in the nation, probably within what some would consider to be the fastest growing state. Uh, unofficially, I believe our population is pushing now somewhere close to about 170 plus thousand people. The, when we refer to Lake Coeur d'Alene as our gem, it truly is. And I have made the statement uh, more than once on different occasions that this community will live or die by the health of Coeur d'Alene Lake. And just so you have a little bit of understanding how the county is structured, we have 44 counties in the state of Idaho. And the way we operate, I am part of a three member board. Uh, my two co-commissioners are Leslie Duncan and Bill Brooks. And every decision we make is a vote of two out of three. Individually, uh, none of us has any authority, but collectively they say we're second only to the governor. Uh, and so that's the structure we have. We do have nine elected officials. The other six are the coroner, sheriff, prosecutor, assessor, clerk. And so we're a total of six, a total of nine, excuse me. And we control all the facilities and all the budgets, but we have no operational authority over the other electeds. So that just gives you a little bit of a background. Uh, the county, the state rather, does permit for a different structure, what's called an alternative form of government. There is a study group that's gonna be formed to study that, and it will look more like a corporate structure if it's adopted, I doubt it will be. It was voted down handily back in 2012. The reason that we're participating in the study, and I was the one who initiated the, re, uh, the request before my board for the $200,000, is that I have long felt that Kootenai County was really not so much underrepresented, but I think um, under in, failed to participate sufficiently. And I think the tribe, uh, the Coeur d'Alene tribe would certainly agree with that. And I don't understand why that is, but I think sometimes, you know, some of the past county commissioners were in a state of denial. And if I truly believe what I've said, that we'll live or die by the health of the lake, then this study is absolutely crucial. So we doted, excuse me, donated $200,000 to uh, the study. And that was a two to one vote, by the way, it was not a unanimous vote, not surprising by the board. One of the concerns that I have and one of the reasons that I wanted to participate is that if you look at our zoning here in Kootenai County, the zoning in the, the shoreline areas are zoned what we call restricted residential, which is five units per acre. So the natural question, and you're probably asking of yourselves is, why would you take the most sensitive ecology and permit the, the, the densest zoning that we have in the county? Some of the other zonings, for example, ag suburban is a two acre minimum, rural is a five acre minimum. And I don't know that I can answer that because it probably goes back decades. But what I can say is virtually all of the discharge systems, if you will, all, all the, their individual septic systems, there are very few package systems around the lake. And so that's one of the concerns that I have. Now, have they been an issue? Probably not, we're not sure. And I guess your study might help determine this, how much discharge is actually uh, uh, attributable to those septics. In any case, uh, we do support the efforts of DEQ. That's why we contributed. Uh, we'd like to have a seat at the table when your study is completed. That is to say that we can participate in the analysis. Uh, we do realize that we're essentially a minor player in this, especially if we go back to the legal arrangements uh, back to the HECLA suit and, and the other uh, uh, legal determinations. But we do want to have a, a hand in the, uh, not only in the um, in discussions regarding any recommendations, but if there is a phase two, we will probably be a key player if there's any remedial action to be taken. And I suspect that's going to come down to the issue of cost. And so um, that's where we're coming from. Specific challenges for us as a county uh, this is not going to surprise many of you. One of the biggest challenges that we face is what we refer to as property rights issues. There are groups and certainly individuals who feel property rights are paramount, so much so that there's almost an attitude among some that it's my property and I'll do as I please. And just to put that in perspective for you, 
when we uh, uh, amended our land use comprehensive plan back in the fall, there was a group that argued for the insertion of the word primacy uh, into, the, uh, into the land use regulations. Well, primacy to me means that it's my property, I can do as I please and I can never be challenged. And I say that because years ago, the state of Idaho abdicated its opportunity for primacy on the Spokane River and Washington took it. And the end result was that the discharge rate from the uh, sewage treatment facility that is required is one minute, close please. To scientific impossibility. But in any case, that's going to be the chief challenge if and when it comes to remedial action. But uh, I look forward to the study and I welcome it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. We're going to go on break now. Uh, and we will please convene only a five minute break. Uh, we're running a little over. Let's reconvene at, uh, at 10 o'clock. Start again in five minutes. Appreciate it very much. Everybody take a break. And again, speakers, please stay around. We've got another uh, talk after the, actually two more talks after the, after the uh, break, but there will be committee questions after that. We'd like all the speakers to be here for those if you could, please. Thank you. See you in five.
All right, uh, let's reconvene if we can, please. Um, and uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe presentation, Phil uh, Kernera of the Coeur d'Alene Tribe uh, will speak next. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Does everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, great. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon and uh, Hesta Squeetsum, good morning. Um, it's really an honor to be speaking today about something very near and dear to my heart and of paramount importance to the Coeur d'Alene people, that being the protection of their homeland and in particular, Lake Coeur d'Alene. So what I'd like to do today is provide you with a little historic context of the tribe's involvement as the original natural resource manager in their homeland. Also give you a little understanding of the contemporary measures that we are involved in. And finally, discuss our thoughts about the NAS study as we move forward and what we are currently embarking upon. I'm really sorry that we can't be in person. Uh, I feel that this is a topic that really needs close contact with another, one another, people looking in each other's eyes, feeling each other's spirits and their hearts and their souls. And this is problematic and will probably remain so for quite some time until we are able to meet again. So I look forward to that time. So briefly, a quick historic perspective. Okay. As Rebecca mentioned, from time immemorial, the tribe utilized the natural resources of their homeland. There was a sacred pact between the creator that put the Shichunch people on, in, and around Lake Coeur d'Alene. They were to protect the natural resources in their homeland. And in return, the people would always have healthy natural resources to sustain their lifestyle. They were a gathering tribe. They were a hunting tribe. They were a fishing tribe. They fished for Chinook salmon. Those days are long gone. Next slide. So as you can see here, the homeland of the tribe was vast and included just some amazing countryside, Lake Coeur d'Alene at the center of their universe. Above that, Hayden Lake, Spirit Lake, then you've got massive Lake Pend Oreille, mountains, streams, what Jamie showed, the network, the dendritic network of waterways that were the lifeblood of the people. Pre-contact, one of the tribal elders used to say that they lived in a utopian society. I hearken and mention Mr. Henry Saijon's name often because he was our spiritual leader on this endeavor. So post-contact, as we all know, disease, logging, mining, road building, armies coming through, trespass, establishment of the reservation where they had to give up nearly all of their homeland to have a reservation that was supposed to be preserved forever into perpetuity for the people. Those promises were made, those promises were broken with the Allotment Act that allowed for white settlement throughout the Coeur d'Alene tribal reservation. What you see as the reservation now is a diminishment of the reservation from two previous reservations that were bigger. The United States government couldn't allow the Coeur d'Alene people to have their original res reservation because of all the minerals and all the timber. So all these things disenfranchised the people from their homeland and they were down, but they weren't out. And I'm here to tell you that the Coeur d'Alene's are revitalized. They're here, they've always been here, and they will always fight for the protection 
of our gem, Lake Coeur d'Alene. So this is just a real quick snapshot of sort of uh, the tip of the iceberg that most people might look at and say, okay, yeah, we recognize what tribes are all about. Well, really, what tribes are all about is what you see underneath worldviews, our worldview about the relationship that the people have with the natural elements of this basin. It's not one of dominion, it's one of relationship. It's one of compassion. It's one of love. Their creation story, they were found here. The Shichung people means those that were found here. So that's what they believe. And most people can't even understand that. Values, seven generation thinking. This is what really people need to start thinking about. What is it going to be like in seven generations from now if we continue on this unbridled path of consumption and abuse of our natural resources? Other things like seven of five senses. The Coeur d'Alene people recognized the problem when it started. All they needed was their five senses to tell them what was right and what was wrong. We can still look at that, but we've done studies. We've studied this place to death. As a matter of fact, 30 years ago, when I started working on this project, people were screaming about no more studies. Well, we're embarking on another study now. So what have we been up to? as far as resource management. It all starts with the tribal membership, which elects a seven member tribal council, which then over time, we've developed a natural resource department, which has such programs as lands, environmental planning, fire, forestry, fisheries, wildlife, air. We have a lake management department that I have the honor to direct which includes programs such as hazardous waste management, recreation management, water resources, shoreline protection, uh, among others. We have the BOM GIS department that has been working for the cause since 1992. We have legal and legislative experts and we all know why we need those guys. We have a cultural department that really provides the overall tenor of how we go about dealing with our business. And we have various committees that we utilize to vet ideas before they ultimately get brought before tribal council. Brief chronology of tribal involvement in the basin. It's really hard to put on one slide 30 years worth of efforts, but uh, a lot of people have already mentioned a lot of the stuff that is in this slide. I just want to highlight a few of them. Of course, in the 90s, EPA really came into town with records of decision one and two, and we filed a natural resource damage assessment lawsuit because at that time, EPA had carved the lake out of any EPA remedy at the behest of the state of Idaho. And we also had to sue the state of Idaho to reaffirm our ownership of the lake. And let me be clear, the only adjudicated portion of Lake Coeur d'Alene has been the Southern portion. The Northern portion of the lake, the tribe claims complete and utter ownership of, and those are considered disputed waters because the state claims ownership as well. I'd also like to point out in the 90s, I was involved in writing a little thing called the Lake Management Plan from 1993, ultimately finalized in 96 with the division at the time of environmental quality. It was basically a status update on water quality and some management actions to try to improve water quality. There was no funding. There was no regulation and it basically died on the vine. The 2000s found us victorious in our lake 
ownership efforts. It found us somewhat victorious in our NERDA uh, litigation where we received over $140 million to do restoration. Though that's pennies on the dollar of what was extracted out of our basin. And now we're still suffering from the billions of dollars that are needed to actually do the remediation and restoration needed in our basin. We got wrapped up in FERC relicensing of the Post Falls Dam. We rewrote the lake management plan. And of course that came out of the record of decision three where EPA was coerced by the state of Idaho to continue to carve the lake out of any Superfund remedy. So we took seven years to rewrite that lake management plan. And that lake management plan I'll talk about in the next uh, talk, but it wasn't much better than the original plan that died on the vine. We also got swept up into water rights litigation by the state of Idaho. Can you imagine a people who roam 5 million acres of land now having to fight for their very existence and every drop of water. The state of Idaho has opposed all of our water rights. They claim we don't have any rights to water in Lake Coeur d'Alene. 2010 finds us implementing the lake management plan, our restoration plan, being involved in the Coeur d'Alene Basin Environmental Improvement Project Commission, still warring like dogs fighting in water rights and uh, implementing FERC 4E conditions to mitigate the vast injuries and damages that we find from Post Falls Dam. We also developed the lake management critique, which we can provide uh, NAS with explaining why we think the lake management plan is a failure. 2020, 2021, basically, we're doing a lot of the same stuff we've been doing for 30 years, and uh, we're taking more strident steps right now to reintroduce salmon back into our territory. And I guess now we're involved in another NAS study. So this was an excerpt from the letter from Governor Little to the Coeur d'Alene Tribes Chairman and understand from my perspective, the reason NAS is in town is because the tribe divorced themselves from the lake management plan and asked the governor and the head of region 10 EPA to come before them to talk about a Superfund remedy for the lake. The state was very concerned and EPA was very concerned and they knew actions needed to be taken. Quite frankly, EPA just basically stayed silent and wanted to sit back and like they've been doing forever on the lake and see what the state and the tribe were gonna do. So in bold here, you can see that the governor was looking to have a third party review of any identified concerns. So that's why the tribe decided to support the NAS study. The original statement of work that the tribe worked with EPA, or excuse me, with DEQ on, and ultimately EPA as well, included 13 tasks. The ones in bold are the tasks that NAS is now going to be doing. But what happened was DEQ Director Tippis started uh, shopping this around with NAS, and NAS said, oh my gosh, this is pretty onerous. It's gonna take many years and it's gonna cost millions of dollars. So what the state decided to do, next slide please, is to put it into phases. Phase one through five is what NAS is charged with now. And I want people to really understand that from my perspective, A, all of these tasks should have been done by EPA. B, phase two, is just out there. It's yet to be determined. But there are some very serious things that need to be dealt with in phase two that from my perspective, we may never even get to. And in specific uh, terms, I'd like to point out that number four and five of phase two, actions to reverse trends, pretty darn important. I think we should be at that right now. 
And five, identify remedial technologies. We want to know what are the technologies out there to address the metals at the bottom of the lake. Forget this lake management plan. We want to know what it will cost to do the work and how long it will take to do the work. And next slide, please. What is missing from phase two? There was one of these tasks back in the original scope of work of 13 tasks. And this is a big one too. And this is really something that is disturbing. EPA defers a remedy on the lake pending the development and effective outcomes of a lake management plan that is proven ineffective now. So what we had asked NAS to do in the statement of work is to evaluate whether EPA should continue deferring the lake remedy by determining the LMP effectiveness and identifying funding sources. This is egregious. We've been asking EPA for several years now after our data came in saying that our water quality is declining to address this issue. Cami Grandinetti, who was presented prior, suggested that she would convene a group to begin considering what evaluation criteria would be used to determine whether the LMP is effective. That's years ago. I have a binder from 1992 of the correspondence that I've written and the tribe's written to the state and to EPA. It's 30 years worth of back and forth letters about the lake and about the basin and our homeland. And we, we want to give this to NAS as well, because you will see all the shenanigans going on to try to keep that lake from ever being protected. Next slide. So what are my thoughts about the NAS study? Obviously, I'm disturbed. Uh, but understand that originally and to this day, we still support NAS moving forward with this study. We also need to keep in the front of our minds the fact that I'm holding the Superfund book that Dan McCracken discussed right in my hand now. It's like my holy Bible. It's got scribbles all through it. It's got recommendations and conclusions throughout it that nobody has acted on in now, published in 05. Here we are, 2021. We haven't acted on this. So why are we optimistic that we're gonna act on anything else? So we need and we hope that this evaluation proves our data is sound. And I am certain it is sound. I have highest regards for DEQ's limnologists and staff, as well as my tribal staff. The data is rigorous and sound. We need your conclusions to be straightforward because if they're not, we're just gonna be bickering over them. We yes, need please, Phil. and political support we need this to be the neutral review that the state requires as their political cover to actually begin doing strident measures. And finally, I think I'm throwing this idea out. I think while NAS is doing phase one right now, which EPA should have done, EPA should start doing phase two immediately. So at the end of 18 months from now, we have both phases done and a complete understanding how to move forward. I do not want to be sitting here in two years arguing over information and what we're going to do in the future and continue to kick the can down the street. The time to act is now. We need action now. We can't wait for the catastrophe to occur before humans take any sort of proactive measures. So with that, I thank you and look forward to uh, this study. Thanks very much, Phil. Thanks a lot. And then it's next, next step is you, uh, along with uh, Jamie Bruner. In the Coeur d'Alene Lake Management Plan. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Philip Sonera again, and uh, I'm going to be talking today with uh, Jamie concerning Lake Management Plan. Hi again, everybody. Jamie Bruner with the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. Okay, so to start this off, I'd like to give a brief history of the Lake Management Plan. Uh, many folks might not know, but in 1993, uh, the tribe was involved in developing the first lake management plan that became finalized in 1996. I was part of writing that plan at the time, the Division of Environmental Quality. It was a plan that basically uh, described the status of water quality and also talked about some general actions that agencies were involved in to deal with nutrient management in the basin. It had no funding or regulatory teeth to it. So in essence, it really just died on the vine. Moving forward in history, after EPA developed their record of decision three, their basin-wide record of decision, at the insistence of the state of Idaho, the lake was once again carved out of any remedial actions uh, by EPA. As a result, EPA wrote in their record of decision that they were going to defer a remedial decision pending the development, adoption, and effective implementation of a lake management plan by the Coeur d'Alene tribe and the state of Idaho. So, it's interesting that uh, the original EPA game plan was for a $1.5 billion cleanup. But as I said, the state of Idaho, who has concurrence authority over the EPA records of decision, told EPA that they would not concur with any remedy that included the lake, thus the deferring the remedy pending this lake management plan. So we worked with the state from 2003 to 2009 to develop the lake management plan that we're talking about right now. And quite frankly, there was a lot of back and forth and wrangling over that plan. And the tribe pretty much looked at the 96 plan and said, for all the reasons that failed, we don't want this new plan to fail. So as a result, we wanted to have strident uh, enforcement actions, regulatory mechanisms, schedules, detailed budgets, and none of that actually got into the plan because like I said, we were doing a lot of wrangling with the local county commissioners as well as the state uh, Department of Environmental Quality at that point. Um, also wanna mention that during the development of the plan, we also were involved in the NAS uh, first study. And that was a direct result of the state of Idaho not wanting EPA to move outside of the box, the 21 square mile box in the upper basin. So there was a lot of stuff going on, but at the end of the day, we did adopt this plan it had no committed funding, no new regulations, and as I said, no schedule for actions. And also, and primarily, it had no EPA involvement, except for EPA throwing some money at the state and the tribe to hire a mediator to, in essence, get to go on this plan. I think that was a real problem and something that the tribe and the state uh, should have realized back in the day that this plan needed EPA involvement. So 10 years later, we're here. We've got declining water quality. We've got uh, a far greater influx of anti-regulation population coming into the area, greater pressures on the lake and ecosystem, climate change, and now we have another NAS study. So that's kind of the history of uh, the lake management plan from my perspective. Thank you, Philip. 
So the lake management plan that we're working with today from 2009, this is the goal verbatim from the plan. And you can see in the figure, um, this is the graphic version of what we're trying to do in the management plan. Um, essentially limiting nutrient inputs watershed wide, basin wide <clears throat> to maintain a metabolism in the lake that keeps oxygen down there in those deeper waters so that the metals that are down in the lake bed sediments stay there. And again, like I mentioned, this is a basin wide plan, just a little refresher on the Coeur d'Alene watershed, about 3,800 square miles, including the Coeur d'Alene River, St. Joe and St. Mary's Rivers, and all of the tributaries that drain directly into the lake. So these are the objectives that are outlined in the plan in order to pursue that goal, improve our scientific understanding of lake conditions, establish and strengthen partnerships to maximize benefits because like Philip said, we're, we're utilizing existing regulatory frameworks. So these partnerships are essential to a successful plan. Develop and implement a nutrient reduction action plan based and wide. Increase public awareness of lake conditions and influences on water quality. And of course, we always need funding. So establish funding mechanisms to support the goal, objectives, and strategies. And I'll just walk through each of these briefly. Objective one, improve scientific understanding. We've been continually monitoring in core locations in the lake since 2007, and we continue it today. Both the state and the tribe are still monitoring. We have conducted a variety of special studies to answer specific questions. And the tribe has been working on um, what was the elcom CADEM model, it's now AEM3D, or Aquatic Ecosystem Model Three-Dimensional. Um, and you'll hear more about that from Dale on Friday. So here are the core monitoring locations. You'll see there are a lot more points on this map than are described in the list. These three sites in the list are the sites that in the lake management plan we committed to monitor regularly, but within the resources we have available, we do also um, roll in other sites as we can. So C1 is up here near Tubbs Hill, C4 is down here near University Point, and C5 is down here at Chippy Point, which has also been called Blue Point. So those are the three in the plan that we've committed to. Objective, objective two, establish and strengthen partnerships. So in the lake management plan, we have management action tables in the appendix, and I'll show you an example of that here in a minute. Um, and those basically lay out all of the entities that might be involved in nutrient reduction activities throughout the basin and some actions that they could pursue and who those lead entities are. We also coordinate with other efforts that are ongoing, the TMDL process through under the Clean Water Act. The Avista Corp, they have a FERC license for operation of the Post Falls Dam. And within that, there are conditions um, under their FERC license to provide funding for um, water quality monitoring, wetland enhancement, fisheries, and erosion control. So we, we coordinate closely with those folks on those activities. And then also the restoration partnership, which is um, the team of trustees involved in developing that restoration plan that I um, showed in the introduction with the, the plan and the environmental impact statement as a source of information. There's a pretty good plan that's been under implementation that addresses um, restoration as opposed to, you know, on, above and beyond remediation. So we work closely with that group as well. We are also a member of the Basin Environmental Improvement Project Commission. You'll also hear them referred to as the Basin Commission. The seven commission member, um, seven member commission that oversees the implementation of EPA activities and restoration efforts in the basin. And we also coordinate very closely with the University of Idaho. They're a um, good partner with our outreach and education and also in performing research. So the management action tables in Appendix C of the Lake Management Plan, they fall under these um, seven categories. And if you wanna read those in depth, like I said, they're in Appendix C and the Lake Management Plan is available online if you don't have that available already. Here's just a snapshot of what one of those action tables looks like. So they're under each category. 
systems development, erosion, and stormwater, there are a series of actions listed. And if you look at, for example, action three at the bottom, improve, improve enforcement of existing stormwater treatment and erosion control requirements. And then it lists the lead groups as the cities, counties, and EPAs. And that's a good example of where those existing regulatory frameworks can be utilized to make some improvements. Objective three is develop a nutrient reduction plan. So we started out with a nutrient inventory report that incorporates a variety of data that were available. Um, and through that inventory, we identified some data gaps that we're currently working to monitor. And in the meantime, we do continue to pursue partnerships that reduce nutrients. And this is just a, a list of examples of sorts of projects we've been pursuing over the last several years. So the nutrient inventory report we have out now, this is just a snapshot of the results. You can see the Coeur d'Alene and the St. Joe River have um, pretty significant nutrient loads coming through there. You also notice in the tributaries to the lake, the yellow area, our confidence level isn't that high because this is where we have some data gaps. And so we're working in those areas currently to get better data, to get a better feel for what those are looking like. Objective four, increase public awareness. We have a variety of in, um, education and outreach programs that we've pursued over the years. Lakeshore Assessment System or Lake Assist is geared towards landowners to implement best management practices that reduce their impact on water quality. The Panhandle Stormwater and Erosion Education Program is geared towards the development and construction community. Our realtor surf and turf training is very popular. We talk to realtors about why water quality is important, why the water quality regulations are there, and what those regulations are. Bay Watchers is a program we have to um, foster community liaisons throughout the lake watershed. And we have workshops to both listen to what the concerns are out there and also to share information from both regulatory agencies and other groups that have information to share. We have a wide variety of um, through 12 and community events that we engage in. We coordinate through our watershed advisory groups and our basin advisory group. And our most recent collaboration is with the RGEM Collaborative. It's basically the group of folks that have helped us organize what we've done for RGEM Coeur d'Alene Lake Symposia so far. And so our planning team, which is Coeur d'Alene Regional Chamber of Commerce, PDA 2030, State, the Tribe, Kootenai Environmental Alliance, Sydney County, I think that's all of them, but that's a, it's a great group of people that we've, we decided we had such good momentum after the last symposium, we wanted to keep that going. And so we've worked as a group to continue to put out uh, press releases in the Coeur d'Alene Press. And we've also done a couple of speaker series that have gotten really good reviews. So that's an ongoing partnership. Establish funding to support the LMP goal, the state of Idaho, um, has some general funds that they've directed towards these efforts. We get EPA lab support to provide analysis of our metal samples that we collect during our core monitoring and other monitoring efforts. We coordinate, like I said, with Avista on their FERC license requirements. So they, they provided funding for nutrient monitoring, um, a lot of bank stabilization work, wetland enhancements, fisheries enhancements, and that's ongoing. Throughout the years, we've had ver a variety of funding for our funding applications for research through the University of Idaho and NSF. Some of those have been funded, some of them have not, but that's how that goes. We collaborate continually with community partners where we see opportunities for value added. We utilize Clean Water Act Section 319 funds to implement non-point source pollution reduction projects. And then the state and the tribe both utilize HECLA settlement dollars to help support lake management activities. So looking to the future, um, as I alluded to in the, in the introductory presentation, and as you'll hear more from Craig and Dale Friday, we are seeing trends going in a direction we don't wanna see them go. And those triggers that we have in the lake management plan that basically serve as an early, early warning system that um, basically lays out what levels of different water quality parameters raise a red flag for us. And what do we do when we see that Basically, the lake management plan says, if we see those triggers being approached or exceeded, that's when we need to dig a little deeper and see what's going on. 
which brings us to why we're here today. The state of Idaho decided that it's time to pursue a third party review and engage with the National Academies to make that happen so that we can um, take a closer look at what's going on and um, hopefully have that inform our path forward. And that last bullet there, I will defer to Philip to address. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I guess just in closing, the tribe developed the critique and stand by it. And certainly NAS will have uh, the opportunity to look through it. We understand that no matter what, the cost to protect our lake will be in the billions and will require landscape wide changes. Unless we all face up to these needs, I really don't have any hope that the voluntary process to reduce nutrients to manage the hazardous wastes will work. Um, I believe that EPA needs to conduct an RIFS for the lake to evaluate cleanup remedies um, and or EPA needs to embrace the lake management plan, help with the tribe and state in rewriting it and take that under their super fund remedy as an institutional control as one mechanism or one approach to remediating the hazardous substances in the lake bed. Um, so with that, I believe we've covered uh, the basics and we'd love to hear from you and provide answers to any of your questions. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so this is the, the next segment of our of our meeting is to uh, address any questions the committee has. Uh, please, committee members, uh, raise your hand if you if you can think of some questions. Um, uh, and I'll keep an eye out here. I think Laura, Laura, did you have a question from an earlier talk that you wanted to start with? Yeah, there you are. Uh, go ahead, Laura. I did, Sam. Thank you. Um, first of all, as, as the representative from the academies running the study, I, I first want to say thank you to um, all of our speakers. Uh, we've, uh, we've crammed a huge amount of information into this, this first morning session, and I really appreciate the hard work that you went to to, in some cases, pre-record your presentations and really fine-tune them. So I, I know people are going to have a bunch of questions, but the person I'm, I'm hoping that Cami Grandinetti is still here, but I wanted, wondered, Cami, if you could just speak in a little bit more detail about why there is no TMDL in the lake for the metals or phosphorus. Just, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, that, that the process started for metals, it fell apart. Why has it never been restarted? Um, and then that the process for phosphorus, I guess, just never got underway. Clearly, there are phosphorus violations in the lake. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can provide the committee with just a little bit more background on why the Clean Water Act process has not led to any type of, of uh, regulatory actions in Coeur d'Alene Lake and what you see the prospects for in the near future of the Clean Water Act taking a larger role. Yeah, hi, I will do my best to answer that question. Um, so first, I just wanna clarify that the metals TMDL was challenged in court for uh, basically a rulemaking um, administrative, administrative Procedures Act uh, violations and the that has not been picked back up again. Nutrients are a harder issue. Right now, both the state and the tribe have water quality standards for nutrients, but they're narrative. Um, they say, that uh, in, the, in the state standards, it says surface waters of the state shall be free from excess nutrients that can cause visible slime growths or other nuisance aquatic growths impairing designated beneficial uses. And, you know, um, narrative standards, you can list water bodies for um, not meeting those. Uh, I think EPA would support and, and has been um, supporting the idea that there could be numeric standards. Lots of other states have developed those. It makes it a little bit clearer when you're evaluating water quality. Um, you know, whether or not, uh, I guess, to get more specific about why this hasn't happened, um, EPA doesn't do this. We approve the state and the tribe uh, listing water bodies. The tribe doesn't have that um, authority under Clean Water Act, but the state does. And I would have to defer to the state for 
where what they're seeing in their water bodies and and their process for listing. I hope that answers your question. Can anyone from the EQ maybe give us a little more insight into possible nutrient standards and whether or not sure. could lead to a TMDL? Sure. Yeah. So this this is Dan McCracken. So um, I guess uh, with regard to the metals. Um, I would just echo, I guess, what, what Cammie mentioned about it. It was challenged in court um, in terms of the priority for re-pursuing that through negotiated rulemaking. Um, it's, it's right now uh, apparent to us that really the major, I mean, the, the major benefit to going through a metals TMDL would be uh, to assist in establishing limits for dischargers. Uh, because we know from all the work through Superfund that the, the overwhelming uh, largest source of metals loading is coming from the riverbed sediment itself. Um, and so until the cleanup progresses further, um, there hasn't, we haven't seen a huge benefit to, um, to establishing those, those loads uh, through, it, through pursuing that TMDL. We, we do, we have the process kind of initiated with developing a watershed advisory group, um, but, but in terms of the prioritization of that, um, it's not seen as a high priority just, just because of the, all the other factors um, playing into the metals loading. With regard to nutrients, I think Cammy, um, Cammy's point um, really kind of gets at the crux of it is that based on the standard, um, we don't see, when, when, when we look at the lake today, we don't see an impairment to beneficial uses from nutrients. And I guess, you know, the issue there is that we, we likely start to see issues with, with metals mobilization before we see, you know, kind of those visual indicators of, of impairments that beneficial uses from, from nutrients. So that's something that, you know, that I think ha has been a topic of discussion for, you know, is that, is that perhaps a tool that we, you know, do that a little more proactively beyond what the narrative standard would, would lead us to do, but that's kind of the status of it today. And just one final clarifying question, Dan, if I could. So Assuming that the nutrient loading were to increase to the point where the, the lake bed became the largest discharger of metals, that changes the situation for the metal TMDL, does it not? Because presumably EPA's remedy, which doesn't fund anything going on in the lake, then you'd have the largest source being an uncontrolled, um, unmanaged situation that perhaps would make a TMDL more palatable or, or more um, you could actually implement a TMDL in that case? Perhaps, I, I think, yeah, I think the biggest thing with, um, with the TMDL at this point is, is just understanding what, you know, what tool does that provide to us that we don't have at our disposal today? And so certainly if, you know, I guess a better understanding of, you know, how much, how much is the bottom of the lake contributing to the overall loading certainly helps us decide that. Further questions from the committee? And if you, if you can't find your raise the hand button, just kind of speak out. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a, a, a question maybe for, for EPA or for uh, DEQ, whoever wants to answer it actually. Uh, we saw some early slides from the, even through the 80s, if I remember right, in the 90s of, of braided streams and, and uh, and big floodplains with braided stream-like channels. Uh, and then at the very end of the EPA talk, you talked about bank stabilization. Uh, have you worked on bank stabilization in the, in the uh, parts of the, uh, the, the Coeur d'Alene River affected by the mine impacts? And if so, like how many miles or how much bank stabilization is done there? Or is it possible? Uh, I didn't hear too much specific about that. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and take that, that question. I'm Ed Marie, it's Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so the primary source of solids led in this case to the Lake Coeur d'Alene is from the lower basin riverbed itself. The banks are a contributor, but we estimate those to be about 15%. EPA has implemented a pilot project to uh, remedy bank stables or to, to basically stabilize riverbanks. There has been ongoing stabilization done by other agencies, uh, part of the Natural Resource uh, Conservation Service, 
I think they've stabilized about, uh, at last count, roughly about 20 river miles of, of banks using uh, rock for the most part as their stabilization uh, issue. Right now we're focusing on a riverbed pilot to address that source of contamination. That's something that's just in the early planning stages at this point. And any riverbank pilot would also include stabilizing the riverbanks at the same time. Our primary goal was to want to make sure that if we're out there doing riverbed work, that we're going to be stabilizing those banks. But until we do so, the ongoing remedial or the ongoing contamination being mobilized out of the riverbed would be a major problem until we're, we're addressing that. So that's our highest priority right now in the lower basin. Thanks. Committee? I'll ask another one if nobody's got one yet. This is a little more esoteric and uh, maybe hard to, harder to answer, but I think it's important to the committee. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Phil and, and uh, Chris, perhaps Dan can address this. I, I know Phil mentioned uh, the importance of public and political support for the conclusions of our study. Uh, do you have any suggestions for us as to ways that that we, that, that we could improve that, uh, I mean, beyond uh, credible science and incredible analysis of this. <laughs> I know that's a, that's, if it's possible, that's a, that's a hard question to answer, but, but, any, but anything that, that could help us, uh, you know, get some hints about how we could, how we could get more traction with, with this report, uh, with, the, with all aspects of the Idaho community. I could, I could chime in for a second on that. I think um, from my perspective, and I'd be interested to hear what Chris has to say, is uh, as you proceed, the more you can engage the public as well as political leaders, the better. Um, if you just come out with a book in 18 months, it's probably not going to be as well received as if we were involved in the process. And as Chris has mentioned, he wants to have some skin in the game. So I think that would be the skin in the game. Chris, any comments? Oh, okay, uh, I think I missed that last comment. Do you want to repeat and then maybe I can respond? I, I, uh, let me see if I, can, if I can restate that and Phil correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, Phil said if we can engage with political leaders and, and the public as we go along, that that might help, uh, help get buy-in um, and uh, make people feel like they use his quotes, have some skin in the game. Did I get that right, Phil? Yes, sir. So how can we improve our public and how, we, how can we improve our report in ways and our work in ways that would, that would improve our public, our buy-in from political and, and local uh, I think Phil is absolutely right. In fact, it's interesting as I sat through the most recent presentations uh, by Phil and uh, Jamie, I was wondering why I didn't invite the press to participate. And I think if we can get the press to monitor some of the uh, presentations, that will essentially open it up to the public. And I think you'll see more political involvement as well. I do think Phil is exactly right on. So for those of us who didn't, who didn't hear, I think uh, Phil, or Chris also mentioned getting the press involved in, as best we can and within the limits of, of how the National Academy works. Uh, did I get that right, Chris? We could, not everybody could hear you very well. Oh, yeah, that is correct. Uh, Bob Hirsch. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great presentations, everyone. Um, particularly for EPA and Superfund program, I'm interested in uh, my little bit of reading I've done so far indicates that there's a history of uh, uh, phosphorus extraction and fertilizer production in the within the mining district, and and but you know, the focus, of course, is on the metals uh, in the remediation. Could you comment about the role of fertilizer production and whether the Superfund addressed that in any way. Yeah, so there is not a known source of phosphorus in the district. At one point they were importing phosphorus and it was being processed at a phosphor, a phosphoric 
acid and fertilizer plant as part of the Bunker Hill smelter complex. Um, they had a number of processes there. So there was imported phosphorus in that case, and there was uh, gypsum that was produced that ended up being high in phosphorus as part of a, uh, a waste product. Most of that gypsum has been placed in the central impoundment area and is under a geomembrane and a covered surface. Um, there are some existing gypsum ponds that are uh, continuing to be monitored and they have the responsible parties as part of a, an agreement with the governments under a consent decree. Um, so there is, I guess, to the, to the extent that they've been addressed uh, in the past, I mean, that whole smelter complex is gone. There's been substantial remediation. Cells have been removed, capped, consolidated, et cetera. Um, and then, so the, the big question for us is how much phosphorus is still moving around in the system in that area. And that's why we're monitoring the influence and effluent of the plant itself, just to, to know what kind of capture and effectiveness we have in that treatment stream. Thanks. Okay, Bob. Any further? Uh, let's see. Laura, do you have a question or is your hand still up from the last time? No, I, I have a new question. Sorry. All right. <laughs> you have to get used to that. So um, I, I wanted to go back to the very brief mentions that have been made of Avista and, and the operation of the Post Falls Dam. If someone could just explain what the implications of that dam are on the water quality situation in the lake, just so that we all have a shared understanding that would really be helpful. It wasn't really touched upon in anybody's talk. Okay, thank you. I, um, this is Philip Cernera. I can at least tell you the tribe's perspective. Um, since we worked with, through the FERC process to ultimately receive $100 million in 4E condition uh, mitigation dollars to try to ameliorate some of the impacts of the dam. Obviously the dam backs up artificially the lake in the summertime and it backs up the water up to Cataldo, which is about 30 miles upstream on the Coeur d'Alene and up the St. Joe River. We have gotten just amazing amounts of problems related to that artificial lake level uh, in particular, from the tribe's perspective, uh, those our lands were flooded. So we lost um, thousands of acres of wetlands. Our river banks are unraveling because of the summer uh, winter drawdown creates a situation where our cultural artifacts get unearthed and exposed in these massive mud flats that ultimately people go out and loot our artifacts. So we have cultural resource protection uh, program going on to try to deal with that. Um, we also have water quality uh, plans going on and monitoring to be able to better understand how the water quality is changing as a result of the high summer waters in the southern portion of the lake, which creates very large areas of warm aquatic habitat that's perfect for invasive species such as northern pike, which are now destroying all of our uh, cutthroat and potentially bull trout. And we also have a little problem called Eurasian milfoil, which is supercharged by warm, shallow waters that are nutrient rich. So we have been engaged in over 10 years of trying to deal with uh, aquatic invasive species. And quite frankly, the cat's out of the bag on that one. And it's basically impossible to control that problem. That problem is now moving up into the northern portion of the lake. Um, so we're collecting information now for the next relicensing, which will be in about 32 years or no, uh, less than 30 years from now. And um, we'll be once again at the table with whatever relicensing process is going on to be able to better express our concerns about how to go about mitigating uh, the problems related to the artificial high levels in the summer. Laura, if I may weigh in a little bit from a different perspective, um, EPA has been studying the lower basin uh, pretty intensely for the last 12 years. 
develop the model and you'll hear more about that on Friday from Kim Prespo. But the operations of the dam itself influence the flows in the river significantly. Um, the lake is operated for recreational purposes in the summer and in the winter it's drawn down to allow spring runoff capture uh, head. Um, but often when we get a large runoff event, the lake will fill up. And if it fills up and floods continue to occur or subsequent floods to continue, continue to occur, it ends up pushing more contaminated water, distributing sediments far and wide in that lower basin and in the lateral lakes and the floodplains. When the water is low, it's like winter water level, eight feet below summer pool, then obviously the water will flow through the lower basin much quicker, be less distributive and get into the lake quicker. Um, but the, the dam was increased twice. It's a natural dam. The lake is a natural lake. And what, what they've done is just increased the pool elevation two different times over, over history. So that's what, uh, I guess that's how it influences the operations and how it influences um, just uh, how runoff events occur in the basin, which is a significant issue when you're trying to, to manage contamination and understand how to remediate it. I'll leave the rest for Kim to talk about it on Friday. Just uh, piggyback a bit on the uh, Coeur d'Alene system that Ed talked about. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to also mention that the tribe's doing some work on the lower Coeur d'Alene system now, looking at the deep meander uh, bends and uh, finding out that in the summertime, those are stratifying. The lower river is actually kind of a extension of the lake. So in the summertime, it stratifies. It goes anoxic. Those deep bends are going anoxic and we are finding amazing amounts of metals releases during anoxia and nutrient releases from those contaminated bottom sediments coming out of the river. And in particular, when drawdown occurs in after Labor Day, we basically see the metals and nutrient flux increasing as waters move down the river system and into the lake. So that's another very disturbing trend that we're seeing, the anoxia in the river that's causing mobilization of metals and nutrients. Thank you. Uh, Robert Steed had a, had a question or a comment. Go ahead, Robert. Yes. Um, good morning, committee. Um, my name is Bob Steed. I'm with the Coeur d'Alene DEQ, and um, I'm the surface water manager. I did work on the relicensing for the Avista Dam. Um, one of the, uh, the, the one of my understandings is is that the lake level and flooding conditions are really controlled mostly by the sill at the inlet or the or the outlet of Coeur d'Alene Lake um, right at the North Idaho College area. Um, so the Avista operates that dam to run um, run full full water through it during the peak of the hydrograph. And any flooding and, and that type of stuff that occurs is really a result of the sill upstream of the dam. They do catch the last portion of water that that um, as the as we're descending on the limb of the hydrograph and do store the lake level. Um, you know, a Vista Dam is, uh, you know, it's it's it 12, 14 feet deep. It's not it's not a uh, 100 foot dam. So I wanted to get that in perspective for the group. It's it's relatively shallow. Um, the state of Idaho did have the Water Quality Certification Authority during the relicensing. And um, for the Idaho portion of, uh, or the uh, state waters, we did have, uh, we did find uh, that the dam um, caused some water quality issues. And we do have conditions in our water quality certification for both upstream and downstream effects of the dam. And we do have a mitigation fund, which um, Avista has been a good player on, and we do work through improvement projects throughout the basin. And I think Jamie brought that up in her presentation, but we do have a, a water, they do provide mitigation and help us with our water quality monitoring portion. Um, there's an erosion component, uh, fisheries throughout the basin, and a wetlands project, a uh, wetlands committee as well that works on that. Thank you. Uh, we got one more minute. If anybody on the committee has any more questions or any other any others want to make a quick comment. 
And Laura, I thought that I remembered that we were going to have a break before the open mic session, but I don't have that on my agenda. Are we going to go right yes. into that? Or? We're going to a break, and during the break, we will pull over people who are going to speak during the open mic session. Okay, so let's 10 minute break. Uh, be back at 10 after 11 for the open mic session, please. Thanks very much, everyone. Great presentations. Thank you very much for all the cooperation and for the really excellent presentation. So we're gonna get a list up here, Laura. working on it. Great. Thanks, Kyle.
All right, uh, so it's uh, time to start our uh, open mic session. And I presume, Cal, if, if I miss anybody here, you will uh, uh, speak up and let me know. But uh, the ones I have on my participant list, I will take. And remember, we have three to four minutes. So I'm going to be really strict about uh, the time on these, just because we've got quite a few people who want to speak. Um, so uh, please stick to the time as best you can. And I'll remind you of when it's at three minutes uh, with, by, with a one minute warning. Okay, uh, the first uh, open mic is Bill Irving. Are you on, Bill? I'm not sure. I'm trying to unmute. I hear you right now. OK, very good. OK, so I have two questions. They both um, are in regards to climate change impact on the health of the lake. Questions probably best for DEQ and um, the tribe. Um, first question is the additional phosphorus from wildfire smoke. Has that been studied as to the impact of uh, that on the health of the lake? That's the first question. Do I wait for the response? Uh, no, go ahead with the other one. Okay. Second question is back in 2015, we had a horrendous wildfire season with very high temperatures. Um, a lot of smoke stratified the lake early and for a longer period of time. So the second question is related to also that harmful algae, algal blooms. Um, so the question, that's more of a general question about whether the effects of climate change, not just in 2015, but additional phosphorus from wildfire smoke, whether they have been studied and would, be, and would then be reviewed by the NAS in their uh, work. Uh, I think it's a good idea if, uh, if, if uh, uh, so does somebody want to address that? Hey, Craig, this is Rebecca with the tribe. Uh, would you mind addressing those? Yeah, hi, this is Craig Cooper, the limnologist for uh, Idaho DEQ. Um, with regress to the climate change and wildfire smoke questions, um, two things. One, 2015 was widely viewed to be a, an example of expected future climate by regional hydrologists. And that year we did see earlier and stronger stratification. Um, we have looked at the potential for wildfire smoke to influence lake chemistry. It's a really complicated question because it impacts both weather patterns and the hydrology for multiple years. We're not, we don't yet have enough data to say what's happening, but we do think we're seeing an effect. But it's something we certainly are looking at. Does that get the question answered? Well, is there enough been studied that the NAS would be able to review it and uh, at least any kind of interim conclusions in regards to climate change impact? There's enough data for the NAS to take a look at. Um, it's a very small uh, time data set and we don't have any reports on it yet, but certainly I think there's some things there for them to look at. Okay, great, thank you. Next, Bill. Uh -huh. Thank you, Craig. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, next is uh, Adriana Hummer. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine, thank you. Thank you, yeah, my question is, has um, there been any involvement from local uh, public utilities that utilize the lake um, as their source of drinking water in any of the management plans and or in this process? What speakers want to take that? This is Rebecca. I can touch on it briefly. Um, just in the last five years or so, we've really garnered some great support from the city of Coeur d'Alene and their stormwater um, division, as well as their wastewater treatment facility. They've gone through very high um, extensive upgrades of which their outfalls or effluent does go back into Spokane River, which is downstream from Coeur d'Alene Lake. So we do work closely with them. As far as drinking water, all the drinking water in, in this area it comes from the uh, Rathrum Prairie Aquifer. So that's the groundwater source just to the north of um, Coeur d'Alene Lake. Can I chime in on that too? Sure, Jamie. Okay, I'd just like to add, I wasn't sure if Rebecca mentioned stormwater with the city of Coeur d'Alene. We have had a lot of good conversations in more recent years with the city of Coeur d'Alene 
they're trying to identify some of their stormwater outfalls that they can take offline and use some um, low impact development style treatment systems for those outfalls. Excellent, thank you. That, uh, I wanna just ask for some qualifying um, clarifications if from Rebecca or Jamie. So the city of Coeur d'Alene is, I assume, sewered and the outfalls go into the lake or elsewhere? So the city of Coeur d'Alene is sewered, but their stormwater is not part of the wastewater treatment system. They have outfalls that go either into, they either have um, injection wells that go into groundwater, depending on where they're at in the city, or there are outfalls that, that drain directly to the lake and the Spokane River. Okay, thank you. So are there any other sewered cities that discharge effluent into the lake? Let me clarify that last thing. The Coeur d'Alene wastewater treatment plant discharges downstream of the lake into the Spokane River. Okay. Thank you. So, and then I think, Laura, you had a question about municipalities that do discharge wastewater into the lake. Um, so we have the city of Plummer, uh, city of Harrison that both discharge um, portions of their effluent to the lake. And then further up in the watershed, uh, we have city that discharge to the rivers as well. Those those are like secondary treatment or tertiary or primarily just secondary. Yeah, we don't have tertiary treatment on the the city of Lane does, but the smaller communities upstream do not. I believe the city of St. Mary's is on tertiary treatment. Mm -hmm. Underwent okay. some yeah. some upgrades, some significant upgrades as well. All right. Um, did we answer that one okay? The next one is uh, Bradley Barnett. Excuse me, my screen keeps flipping around. Bradley Barnett. Uh, thank you, th thank you, Sam. Uh, I'm the vice president of sustainability of Bunker Hill Mining Corporation. Uh, we're a team that, that just arrived on the scene at Bunker Hill Mine about a year ago and started conducting the first exploration uh, that's occurred at the mine in, in over 30 years. Uh, but as you know, uh, the, the mine is the major contributor of a range of constituents of concern into the central treatment plant, uh, which later processes that water and discharges into the South Fork of the Coeur d'Alene River. Uh, I, I guess I just I didn't have a question, but wanted to say if there's any way that Bunker Hill Mine could contribute to the study or, or further understanding in any way, uh, we're, we're happy and available to do so. Great, Bradley. Thanks very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Norman. I'm sorry, again, my screen. Norman Semenko. Good afternoon. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you folks. Uh, my name is Norm Semenko, and I'm an attorney uh, with Parsons Bailey. I grew up in the area in Kootenai County and uh, here today observing on behalf of Hagadon Hospitality. Uh, they were referred to earlier. That's the Coeur Lane Resort and Golf Course on the North Shore, uh, and we really appreciate the good work that you all are doing. Uh, we think science is very important. Uh, as you can tell, even today in a scientific discussion, there's a lot of emotion and attachment uh, to the lake. I, I get that. I grew up in the area, and, and that's appropriate, um, but having this group come in and look at the science is, is very important, and we're certainly supportive of that. Uh, I really appreciated the clarification at the beginning that that you're not here to provide solutions. You're here to look at the science and help us understand what, what the challenge is. Um, I also really appreciated um, Mr. McCracken's comments on behalf of the state, uh, the importance um, of the economic and cultural center at the north end of the lake, uh, how that uh, is is differently situated than, than some of the issues that you had highlighted today. That's important to understand. Um, the fact that the lake continues to be popular, uh, that's an understatement. Uh, and the public access from I-90, uh, which was mentioned, as well as US-95, which is a north-south uh, highway. And that north-south highway connects uh, Coeur Lane to uh, what wasn't mentioned today is uh, another uh, resort uh, and a casino golf course, another golf course um, that's owned by the tribe uh, that I think is a very important part of the economic um, analysis here as well. So uh, really appreciate those comments focusing on the importance of the area. Um, 
the several re <clears throat> several resorts that were referenced by Mr. McCracken, I think may have been a reference to the fact that you've got the uh, the uh, resort at the north end and, and then also down in Worley, the one owned by the tribe. Um, Hagedon Hospitality is vitally interested in the outcome of this. Um, what kinds of science is identified? Uh, again, really appreciated the stout study outcomes that were suggested by Mr. McCracken. Uh, there needs to be a high level of confidence in the science. Um, when you're talking about things that could potentially um, change uh, the lay of the land there, uh, alarm bells that can be rang by certain suggestions being made um, in terms of the future of the lake, uh, it's critical that there be confidence in, in the science. So I really appreciated that. Uh, also a clear understanding of the scope and the urgency and also um, consensus going forward, that there be consensus on, on where we need to go. So uh, we're here to listen. We'll be here to listen on Friday as well. Uh, we've been involved. Uh, obviously we were involved in the relicensing um, those settlement negotiations on the Avista Post Falls Dam and in any number of other um, machinations around the, the, the lake. And we'll appreciate being able to be involved in this process and watching your good work as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Norman. Uh, Brendan Dowling. Uh, let's see, we haven't heard from Brennan unless you're on mute. Oh, you are. Let's go on to Sally Emerson. We'll come back to Brennan if he's, if he's here. Sally Emerson, Sandy Emerson, I'm sorry, Sandy Emerson. Uh, Eric, are we having trouble with people's mutes? Am I on mute or am I back off here? Okay, Sandy Emerson, is that you, Sandy? Yeah, this is Sandy Emerson. Um, okay, we hear you loud and clear. All right, thank you so much. I'm uh, a member of a couple different um, natural resource commissions and committees uh, here in Coeur d'Alene, and I've been, uh, was on some of the formative committees for the Lake Management Plan and the Basin Commission, so I've been doing this for a while myself, but as a citizen. And my question is just, is the, um, uh, lake uh, effect of reactivating or mobilizing the lead um, in the bottom sediments, a proven fact when um, the uh, phosphorus increases or the uh, oxygen uh, becomes a more of a factor, or is that mostly theoretical at this point? I heard what Phil said. It sounds like there's some uh, measurements going on that I might be uh, answering my question, but I know over time it's kind of been theoretical. Thank you. Um, hey, Sandy, this is Craig Cooper again. We did a three-year study at a very small uh, anox bowl in the far northwestern corner of the lake that's not represent the overall lake, just a small microcosm that does go anoxic in the summer times. Um, and we did in that very small place outside of uh, Black Island Marina, do find the metals released from the sediments when the waters go hypoxic and both anoxic. And I don't know what Dale has seen in the south, but I think he's seeing something similar. And yes, both lead, zinc, and cadmium come out. Thank you. No, uh, this is Dale Chess. Uh, oh, I'll go ahead, Jeff. Tried. Yeah, I can add to that. So. Uh, so the, the, the metals that we see released in the uh, lower Coeur d'Alene River uh, during anoxic conditions are lead, dissolved lead, cadmium, and zinc, and arsenic. Uh, in the St. Joe, when the St. Joe goes anoxic, which it does also, uh, we see high levels of uh, arsenic uh, being released from, from those sediments. And with that, we see high levels of, uh, of uh, reactive phosphorus also being released from those sediments. Yeah, us too. So it is not theoretical. It's happening. We've been measuring it for quite a long time now. Yep, agreed. It is real, it happens. We see it in the hard data and it's consistent with biogeochemical theory. So yeah, Sandy. 
Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to uh, move. Brendan Dowling, are you here? Not. I'll go on to Greg uh, Delavan. Greg? Check if you're on mute, please. I guess we don't have Greg either. Uh, again, we're not having trouble with mutes or anything, are we? Are we, Eric? Okay, uh, I think that's all. That's all that I can see on my list of of, uh, of open mic. Yeah, um, we might um, we might have a couple more people if we could just take like a thirty second break to see if there are a few more people that might not have understood how to use the raise hand feature. Okay. Um, I'll wait for Eric to let us know if there are any more that might be coming over. Okay, very good. Yeah, so those on the attendee side, if you raise your hand, we can give you the ability to speak if you want to take additional questions. And to people to raise your hand, they're in different places in different right. systems. Right, so Sam, if you look at your Zoom on the attendee side, the attendee tab, you should see two hands raised. Um, and we can allow those participants to speak. And now I think they're I think they're transferring over to the panelist side, so they're 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 on their way over. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the delay, folks. Let's see attendees. And now on the the panelist side, you should see two hands raised on the panelist end on the under the panelist tab. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, Tom McLaughlin. Hello, um, Tom McLaughlin. I'm the conservation chairman with the North Idaho Flycasters. A few questions. Um, as you look at the heavy metals that are in suspension in the water column, what percentage, percentage of those are migratory coming out of the river system? That's first question. Second question, are there any technologies currently employed in other situations to filter these suspended metals out of the water column? And then the third question I have, is there any technologies out there to encapsulate the metals that are in the sediment base of the lake? Um, and I use an example in well drilling, the bentonite that would encapsulate it so it can't refine its way back into the water column. Anybody want to address those questions from the speakers? Yeah, hey, Tom, yeah. Uh, Craig Cooper. Oh, oh sorry, Let's I go with, the first. Want to go, go to first, Ed? Yeah, let's, let's do first. Ed first and then Craig. All right, thank you, Mr. Cooper. Um, I'll just say, Tom, there are high levels of dissolved metals through moving through the South Fork and the main stem of the Coeur d'Alene River the lateral lakes and into Lake Coeur d'Alene. There's, there's a huge source out there. What Craig and Dale are talking about are individual data studies they've done. I think Dale's done several of them in diff different deep pools, but the overall um, concentrations of dissolved metals is significant, especially with zinc moving through the system. It's a constant flow um, from many sources. So um, that's, that's something that's ongoing. Um, and I think that's just going to continue it even as we attack it from in the upper basin and attack the various sources. I think Craig's going to talk more about his knowledge on, on metals going into solution. And that's a little bit different of a nuance on the conversation. Um, I will say with respect to technologies, there are certainly capping technologies out there and confined aquatic disposal cells are something that are used by EPA and other, you know, on, and other agencies on environmental cleanups commonplace throughout the world. Um, so those technologies are viable. There's, there's a lot to them and it's complicated in a system like this, there wouldn't be an easy answer, but it is something that could be done if, if it were right. And if you could get the sources under control, which is what we're working on right now. Um, I'd like to reinforce from Ed that the dominant source by far of metals into the lake is coming from the Coeur d'Alene River. Um, there are some 
the northern lake, there's a small spot where it comes out in the summer, but it's a very, very, very minor and very localized. Again, I don't know the situation down in the south, but I think there's a lot of sediment source down the south from correct dale. As for technologies, yeah, it's this capping technologies. That would be very hard to do. There's also techniques for doing monitored attenuation using national sediments that come in from the rivers. It's a very hard, large, complicated system, and I'm not an expert on it, but they do exist. Uh, I'll just add add a couple other comments to that. I think I think the big for the technologies that we run into is the scale. When we're talking about capping the entire bottom of the lake, um, you know, just becomes a feasibility challenge. And then with that, I mean, even if we were to completely be ensured that the metals wouldn't release off the bottom of the lake, we still need to manage nutrients because as Cami showed pictures of what we have, what we have happening right now in Fernand Lake, where we don't have metals, we still have issues. The excess nutrient loading still causes issues for us in terms of water quality. So we still have kind of the same issue, whether or not the metals come up in terms of making sure that we don't get to a, to a state where we have excess nutrients in the lake. Yeah. I'd like to follow up with Dan real briefly is that from a nutrient management perspective on the lake, we are in a position now where we look at the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus that in the summer we are at risk for algae blooms, even though we don't see them in the lake yet. I would, I would like to add something. Um, so I think we, we do have some, you, you'll see it on Friday uh, at site C5. We do have, I think, some evidence of uh, some, I would call it enhanced benthic flux due to low oxygen in the hypolimnion at C5 in the southern basin. And uh, that in itself looks like it could be um, increasing the uh, benthic flux rates of zinc uh, from those from, from that hypolimnion. So in the summertime, and I think Kuwabara's study, well, one of Kuwabara's studies, uh, Kuwabara et al., I, don't, I forget which year, uh, described that, I think it was during the summertime that benthic flux in the lake could supply as much zinc to the water column as the Coeur d'Alene River uh, can. So there is there is some evidence that that the benthic flux of zinc itself is very important uh, from a seasonal uh, aspect, seasonal standpoint. Right, thank you. Uh, uh, let's see, Did I, have I gotten to everybody? Uh, Shelly Austin, are you a new person on here or have we gotten to you? No Hi, I am a new oh. person. Thank you for okay. giving me the opportunity to ask. Um, sure. I was just digging around through my notes and unfortunately I can't identify the woman who spoke about funding sources and how they, that person, and I'm, I really wish I could remember who it was, but my question is, this was a, either Idaho or I'm sure it wasn't tribe. I, I think it was probably Jamie Bruner. I think it was. Thank you, Dan. I think it was. Um, and you talked about other funding sources. You talked also about the um, opportunity to work with partners and other organizations. But my question for you is, are you not funded by the state? Why are you seeking additional funds for these projects outside of your own purview? So we do have some funding through the state to perform some of the core functions of the lake management plan. And um, unfortunately that primarily covers staff time and the monitoring activities, equipment and supplies, education and outreach, all of those activities that we do. Project implementation, on the ground project implementation and research, we do try and reach out and find more funding sources to kind of leverage we use our state funding to leverage some other funding sources to do more, more with the resources that we've got. So there's a combination of state and also outside and um, the HECLA settlement funds and also the Avista funding that they provide as part of their FERC license as well. Does that so answer you, your question? Sort of, so you are seeking private donations? We don't necessarily seek private donations. It's more of, uh, on the level of grant funding, for example, the restoration partnership, they have a restoration plan that they have money available for on the ground restoration projects that enhance habitat. And our focus of course would be reducing nutrient inputs to the basin. Right. So we don't look for private donations, but we do look for funding sources that are out there for the specific purposes that we're trying to accomplish. 
Okay, thank you so much. And I do want to introduce myself. I'm Shelley Austin and I'm the new executive director for the Kootenai Environmental Alliance. I just, just started. We have not been able to send out a press release, but I'm really anxious to meet all of you individually and continue this discussion. Thanks for including me today. Nice to meet you, Shelley. Yeah, or nice Julie. to meet all you guys. Yeah, Thanks, Shelley. glad to be here. Uh, okay, next we have Sky Walden. Hello, um, I am the committee chair for the climate um, and then, and, and I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. You guys, I follow a lot of you guys doing stuff and I just have a sort of a bit of envy and uh, you know, a lot of respect for all of you. Um, but I'm the climate and uh, environmental justice uh, chair for the NAACP, um, the local chapter. And I hopped on here late. So unfortunately I missed everything up until this last, um, you know, hand raising section. I was wondering if this is going to be posted anywhere. I see it's recording. Laura? Yeah. The recording of this session will be available in about a week or two. Uh, it'll be on our event page. Okay, awesome. And then I just also, it sounds like this is a lot of stuff that was talked about during the RGEM. Um, collaborative uh, speaker series um, from the 2020 um, September edition. Um, has anybody talked about bioremediation at any point? We did not hear anything about it today, but uh, if anybody has any comment about bioremediation from the speakers panel. Yeah. We have not attempted any bioremediation uh, within the Coeur d'Alene Basin from EPA's perspective. I'm Ed Marine. Um, one of the challenges we have is that the concentrations are so high in this area that um, bioremediation oftentimes creates another waste product. So you, you create a waste product that then has to be managed. So if the plants are uptaking the vegetation, you don't want it to be eaten by deer or cattle or what have you. So it's it's a challenging situation. I, it, is always appealing and we'd love to find an easy way to deal with the widespread lead and other heavy metals in the system. But to date, there has been no maxi, you know, magic dust, so to speak. Thanks for asking. Yeah, uh, thank you um, for taking my question here and I look forward to actually getting to uh, see what was discussed here today. Thank you. So let's ask again, Brendan Dowling. With Greg Delavon. Uh, it looks to me like that's everyone then. Is there, are there any others, uh, Eric? I don't see any other hands. I guess that is everything for today. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, all the attention and for the excellent presentations and the excellent questions and the excellent open mic session. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing everybody on Friday. Thanks a million. See you on Friday. Thanks much. Take care.